Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the Menlo Park Planning Commission meeting of August 9th, 2021. I am uh, Vice Chair of the Planning Commission, Chris DeCarty. Our Chair, uh, Michael Doran, is out this evening, and so I will be chairing through the course of the evening. Our first item uh, is uh, roll call, uh, and I'll ask the commissioners in alphabetical order to um, acknowledge their presence, beginning with Commissioner Barnes. Good evening. I believe Commissioner Harris. Good evening. Commissioner Riggs. I am present. Commissioner Tate. Present. And just checking with staff, I believe Commissioner Kennedy also indicated that she would not be here this evening. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So we have five of our seven commissioners present, which is a quorum. So we can um, go through with the meeting this evening. Uh, just a note for everybody that uh, we are still operating uh, remotely. Um, so this is a teleconference meeting. All members of the Planning Commission, city staff applicants, and members of the public are participating by teleconference. You will have the opportunity uh, this evening to participate and at appropriate times. Um, that is uh, initially with public comment of items that are not on the agenda, and then also during public comment of any agendized item you will have the opportunity to participate and we'll give further instructions at that time. Uh, with that, I will turn to item C on our agenda, which is reports and announcements and turn to principal planner Parada, who is our liaison this evening. Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Ducardi and members of the commission. Uh, I do have a few updates. Uh, so one, uh, some commissioners may have seen an email earlier regarding a project at 124. Dunsmuir Way. Um, so that project is postponed. It was uh, calendared for the, the agenda tonight, uh, but unfortunately there was a noticing issue with the newspaper. So we did send our postcards out, but it didn't get into the, the actual newspaper for the public hearing notice. Uh, so that item is, on, is gonna be on a future meeting. We'll send a new public hearing notice and new postcard when that's available. Um, there may be members in the public interested in speaking on that item tonight. So. Uh, uh, Vice Chair DeCarty, at your discretion, you can uh, allow those members to speak under public comment since the item is not listed on the agenda. And so that's my first update. Second update, wanted to give uh, the commission an update on the housing element. So uh, we are currently, uh, the city, doing a housing element update community survey. So that's now available on the city's website. It's open until 829-21. So we would appreciate uh, members of the community's feedback on the housing element uh, update for Menlo Park. Um, we are also hosting pop-up events. So the next event is scheduled for Sunday, August 29th. We'll be at the Menlo Park Farmer's Market. There'll be staff there to explain the housing element update in more detail and field questions about the update. Uh, that will be during the Farmer's Market. It runs from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And so that concludes my reports and announcements. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Principal Planner Peralta from commissioners? All right, seeing none, uh, just uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunities for the public to participate and to provide input into the housing element. That's a crucial part of the future of our city. And so encourage anybody listening tonight to do that and also to encourage your neighbors in the community to do so as well. Uh, that concludes item C, reports and announcements. We now move to item D, which is public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject that is not listed on the agenda uh, to be looked at later tonight uh, and items listed under the consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. And following up on Principal Planner Peralta's point about the item that was um, uh, posted and withdrawn, by all means, if you have a comment this evening, um, please make that on that item during this public comment period. Um, it will be agendized at a future date. You'd be able to come back at that point and participate again. Uh, but we'd be happy to receive your comment even though we can't act on it um, or any other comment on an item that is not on the agenda this evening. 
Uh, and with that, I will turn over to Mr. Tapia to explain how you can participate. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair DeCarty, members of the public. If you do have a comment at this time that you would like to share, as uh, Commissioner DeCarty did mention, please feel free to go ahead and click on that raise hand feature icon on your screen at this time, and that'll indicate to staff that you do have a comment. Otherwise, if you are listening into this phone call, if you go ahead and click star nine on your keypad, that'll also indicate to staff that you do have a comment at this time. So you have one of those two options, clicking the hand icon on your screen, or if you're listening into this call via phone, utilizing the star nine feature on your keypad. And at this time, Commissioner Ducardi, I'm not seeing any public comments, but we can give it a second or two to see if any come through. Good, let's, let's give it at least a minute for people to okay. do that if they wish. All right, that's probably a quick minute, but uh, <laughs> anybody at this point? I can confirm there are no comments at this time. All right, thanks for your help on that, and we will see you again soon. Uh, but with that, I will close item D, which is public comment, and I will turn to item E, which is the consent calendar. We have one item under the consent calendar this evening, which is approval of the minutes from July 12th. Uh, do I either have a commissioner who would like to poll the item for editing or to make a um, recommendation to approve the consent calendar. Mr. Ducardi. Yes, Mr. Riggs, Chair, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Riggs. I will uh, move to approve the consent item. So we have a motion to approve as submitted. Do we have a second? I see a second from Commissioner Barnes with a hand waved. Uh, yes, move to uh, I have a second. Great, so with that, we have a first and a second. So we'll go ahead and um, do a, a voice or a visual roll call for approving as submitted, beginning with Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Same. And uh, I also vote to approve, so that is approved with the five present commissioners. With that, I will close item E, the consent calendar, and now turn uh, to item F, which is a public hearing. Uh, and bear with me while I read um, the entirety from our agenda. This is item F1, which is a use permit, architectural control, below market rate housing agreement, public utilities easement abandonment, and associated environmental review with Andrew Marcos for Graystar at 104 Constitution Drive, 110 Constitution Drive, and 115 Independence Drive, which is called the Menlo Portal Project. This is a request for a use permit, architectural control, environmental review, below market rate housing, agreement and BMR density bonus to redevelop three parcels with approximately 335 multifamily dwelling units, inclusive of 15 additional bonus units, units for the incorporation of on-site below market rate uh, units per the city's BMR housing program. That's chapter 16.96.040. Approximately 34,499 square feet of office and approximately 1,600 square feet of neighborhood serving commercial space. The proposed project would contain two buildings, a seven-story multifamily residential building and a three-story commercial building with office use on the upper levels and neighborhood serving commercial space on the ground level. Both buildings would include above grade two-story parking garages integrated into the buildings. The project site is located in the RMUB, that's Residential Mixed Use Bonus Zoning District. The project site currently contains three single-story office buildings that would be demolished. 
The proposed residential building would contain approximately 326,816 square feet of gross floor area with a floor area ratio of 234%. The proposed commercial building will contain approximately 36,100 square feet of gross floor area inclusive of the ground floor neighborhood serving commercial space with a floor area ratio of 25%. The proposal includes a request for an increase in height, density, and floor area ratio, FAR, under the bonus level development allowance in exchange for community amenities. The proposed project would include a below market rate housing agreement that requires a minimum of 15% of the units or 48 units of the 320 maximum units allowed by the zoning ordinance before accounting for the 15 bonus units, bonus units be affordable. The applicant is proposing to incorporate 15 additional market rate units, which are included in the total 335 units per the density bonus provisions in the BMR housing program, again, chapter 1696040, which allows density and FIR bonuses and exceptions to the city's zoning ordinance requirements when BMR units are incorporated into the project. As part of the project, the applicant is requesting an abandonment of an existing public utility easement within the project site. The proposed project includes a lot line adjustment and lot merger and 10 heritage tree removals. The proposal also includes a use permit request for the storage and use of hazardous materials, diesel fuel in this case, for emergency backup generator to be incorporated into the proposed project. The fire, final environmental impact report, ERI, pursuant to CEQA, uh, was released on July 30th, 2021. The final EIR for the proposed project does not identify any significant and unavoidable environmental impacts that would result from the implementation of the proposed project. The final EIR identifies potentially significant environmental impacts that can be mitigated to less than a significant level, LTS slash M, in the following categories, air quality, transportation, and noise. The final EIR identifies less than significant LTS environmental impacts in the following categories, population, housing, greenhouse gas emissions. The city previously prepared an initial study for the proposed project that determined the following topic areas would have no impacts, less than significant impacts, or less than significant impacts with mitigation measures, including applicable mitigation measures from the Connect Menlo EIR. These are aesthetics, agriculture and forestry resources, biological resources, cultural resources, energy, geology and soils, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, land use and planning, mineral resources, noise, construction period, ground borne vibration and aircraft related noise, public services, recreation utilities, and service systems and wildfire. The initial study identified tribal cultural resources as a potential topic to be analyzed in the EIR and further evaluation determined that impacts to tribal cultural resources would be less than significant and this topic area was not studied further in the EIR. The draft EIR was circulated for an extended 60-day public review from December 4, 2020 through February 2, 2021, and the Planning Commission held a public hearing on the draft EIR at its meeting on January 11, 2021. The final EIR includes responses to all substantive comments received on the draft EIR. The proposed, excuse me, the project location does not contain a toxic site pursuant to the section 6596.2 of the government code. F2 and G1 are associated items with a single staff report. Let me stop here and check with principal planner. Um, does that mean I should go ahead and read the G1? and then conduct these together right now, is that correct? Excuse me, I take that back. We stop here, F2 and G1 are the next items. Apologies. Yeah, you, you, you got it. I just ran myself in circles. Um, with that, um, let me turn it over to staff. Um, uh, and I believe that is... Who's, uh, anyway, let me turn it over to um, our principal planner on the project. Please take it away. Thank you, Vice uh, Chair, and uh, good evening, commissioners and members of the community. I just want to check that you can hear me clearly. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, if you can just give us a moment, we're just going to bring up the presentation. Uh, for this evening.
I'm sorry, there's a little bit of delay, so please, if you could just give us a moment. Here we go. Um, good evening again. Uh, the project before you this evening is a redevelopment of the site with the Mendo Portal project. The site consists of 3.2 acres with three parcels that are located at 115 Independence Drive, 104 Constitution Drive, and 110 Constitution Drive. The project site is located um, south of the Bayshore, um, Bayfront Expressway, excuse me, and east of Marsh Road. Um, the project site, as I said, is 3.2 acres. Um, the project is proposing redevelopment of this site with an apartment building uh, with 335 uh, rental units and a 34,500 uh, square foot office building. Um, the office building would have uh, a community amenities on the first floor with associated outdoor open space. As part of the project proposal, uh, the applicant is uh, uh, requesting a lot merger of the property located at 115 Independence Drive and 110 Constitution Drive. And this um, uh, parcel is, is to receive uh, the, uh, the multifamily uh, building with 335 units and a lot line adjustment between the newly created merged parcel and the corner lot at uh, the intersection of Independence and Constitution. Uh, would create the parcels that would receive the office building. Both parcels together make up the project site. As the vice chair mentioned, uh, the applicant is seeking approval of the final environmental document uh, or certification of the final environmental document, adoption of the mitigation, monitoring, and reporting program, approval of the use permit, architectural control, below market trade housing agreement, the community amenities agreement, and a recommendation on PUV abandonment or public utility easement uh, the abandonment as part of the request. The site, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, 3.2 acres. And under the zoning uh, ordinance, the maximum allowed density without density bonus would be 120 units to an acre, which would yield 320 units. The project is proposing to dedicate 48 housing units or 15% of the 320 units allowed under the base density towards inclusionary housing or below market rate housing. These housing units will be at various income levels, that is very low uh, income, a low income and moderate income levels. Um, the Housing Commission reviewed this proposal and have recommended approval to the Planning Commission. As I mentioned, the project is seeking a density bonus and an increased FAR. Therefore, the project is required to provide community amenities. And the applicant is proposing a couple options for that. Um, both options essentially um, provide the childcare facility on the first floor of the office building. But uh, the first option provides uh, $5.4 million towards financial subsidy, which would provide a tuition uh, subsidies for low-income households, uh, students from the low-income households. And the second option would provide a $2 million financial subsidy and an additional $3.77 million um, towards the community in lieu fee, which was recently adopted by the city council. Um, the $3.77 million includes the 10% administrative fee as well. So uh, the option one will meet the um, appraisal value, which is uh, $8.55 million, and option two goes beyond that because of the inclusion of the 10% uh, administrative fee, which is required by the ordinance amendment. However, the applicant is also requesting that the planning commission provide them flexibility and in case they are unable to provide the childcare facility that they are allowed to pay directly the $9.4 million in lieu fee, which would be the 110% of their appraisal value. 
um, as, uh, as part of the city BMR housing program, the applicant is allowed to request for waivers. In this case, the applicant is requesting that the residential parking be reduced by 15 spaces um, and that uh, five of the short-term bicycle parking spaces be located outside of the required 50 feet zone uh, near any building entrance. Lastly, along with this request is a PUE abandonment. Um, as I mentioned, the applicant is requesting to uh, a reconfiguration of the project site. And because of it, there are some existing uh, public utility easements that are in conflict with the building footprint. Um, so the applicant is requesting that the planning commission review the, uh, the changes and the relocation of the PU abandonment, find it consistent with the general plan, um, and, and recommend uh, approval to the city council. The city council will be the final authority on approving the PUE abandonment and planning commission is in a recommending position for this particular aspect of the project. Juan, can I go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so for this meeting, uh, staff recommends that you follow a format. Um, after my presentation, uh, we would have our environmental consultant, LSA, present the findings of the final EIR, uh, following which the applicant would go over the project proposal in, in minute detail, including the community amenities proposal. Um, after that, we request that uh, the Planning Commission open up uh, this meeting for public comments and then uh, ask uh, comments uh, or provide comments and questions to staff. And finally, ending the meeting with a deliberation and a vote on the project. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission adopt three resolutions, which are part of the, your packet this evening. The first resolution would certify the environmental document, adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and adopt the CEQA findings. The second resolution would approve the use permit request, architectural control permit, below market rate housing agreement, and community amenities operating covenant. I have to note that the Community Amenities Operating Covenant that is currently part of your package is designed around option one of the Community Amenities proposal. Should the Planning Commission decide to go with option two, then staff will have to uh, tweak the, uh, the Operating Covenant slightly to include the in-lieu fee of $3.77 million. The basic operation of the childcare facility under option two wouldn't change. So all those other conditions would still apply. And finally, the resolution to um, recommend approval of the abandonment to city council. The resolutions are subject to conditions of approval, which are also part of your staff report. And before I conclude my presentation and hand it over to um, LSA, I wanted to note three edits in the staff report, which are uh, our oversight. Uh, on page nine, I want to clarify that the height of the building is uh, 83 feet, nine inches, and that of office is 40 feet, one inch. Both these height modifications are consistent with our zoning ordinance standard, and the findings of the staff report wouldn't change with this minor um, edit. Next would be uh, in table six, uh, the in the parking requirement, the office parking ratio would be C, uh, uh, excuse me, 2.72 instead of 2.71 for 94 parking spaces for the office building. And lastly, for table 11, uh, there is a typo. The total um, value should have been 
$370,000 instead of the uh, $837,000. There is a zero missing. Finally, I would like to conclude that there were three um, letters of communication received by staff after publication of the staff report, which have been shared with the Planning Commission and are attached to the agenda. And with that, I am um, available for any questions that you might have and would like to turn it over to LSA. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Principal Planner Pagata. Do, do I have your last name correct? Yes, it's Pagat. It's Pagat. Yes, very close. Pagat. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologize for not being able to see your face when we turn this over to you. Thank you for laying that out. Um, I want to do two quick things with uh, our fellow commissioners. One is the recommended approach this evening. Uh, would ask us as commissioners to withhold our questions until we've heard from the EIR consultant, the applicant presentation, and public comment. Then we could ask both clarifying questions or also, um, you know, deeper questions. Are as commissioners, are you okay with that um, approach this evening, as opposed to asking for clarifying questions now? Maybe just nod or thumbs up. All right, I'm, uh, Commissioner me. Barnes, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair DeCarty. Um, so holding for those three segments, uh, tell me uh, if you would, why asking questions, clarifying questions related, for instance, to just the EIR section is not a good idea? Um, I don't know that it's a good idea or a bad idea. I was just um, relaying the recommended approach from staff and seeing that was okay. I'm, I'm very happy to approach it differently. And if um, the preference of any one of the commissioners is that we go through each of these and stop for clarifying questions. I'm very happy to um, lead that way. So if, if that's a preference of yours, I'm happy to, to do that. No problem. And I would say I don't have a strong uh, a recommendation either way. I wanted to know the, the, the reason behind that. And if it, if it sounds like a good reason, I'm happy to go with it. Um, could someone clarify that? Through the Chair, I think that might be yeah. a question for staff. Yeah. Yep. So the the reasoning for that is sometimes clarifying questions tend to lead into discussions, potential deliberations, uh, potentially moving us away from the presentation overview aspect of the project or the EIR or um, staff's presentation or the applicant's presentation. So uh, as long as they are truly clarifying in nature and, and just meant to kind of gather information along the way, that that's totally fine. We just want to try to limit the dialogue to after public comment when the the commission is then charged with actually deliberating and taking an action on the project. Point well taken. I, I would suggest that we look to our colleagues to be really on point if it is in fact a clarifying question in the moment and keep that procedure. Um, so I would prefer we stay with the availability of clarifying questions and at the same time recognizing it's best practice not to be off in the weeds on non foot clarifying questions during clarifying question time. So my request would be we allow for them in the moment if there is something, but being sure and trusting the rest of my colleagues as well as myself, that it is in fact a clarifying question. That would be my preference. Perfect. Let's, uh, that's great. It needs to work for every commissioner. I think that works very well. So we'll approach it that way. Um, with that, um, are there any clarifying questions for staff at this point in the um, presentation we just received? Um, Through the chair. Yeah. If I could actually clarify something then, uh, to piggyback on this theme about clarifying. So one, one additional item from the presentation that uh, wasn't brought up, but I wanna make sure it's clear for the commission. These are th resolutions, the, the resolutions of the planning commission. Uh, resolutions do per government code require a uh, majority of the, uh, the body to vote in the affirmative if the planning commission was to go that way tonight with their vote. So um, it's, not a it's not the majority of the quorum here tonight on an affirmative vote it'd be the majority of the planning commission, which is seven members. So four votes would be necessary for an affirmative vote tonight. I just wanna clarify that in terms of how resolutions work versus quasi-judicial uh, like use permit applications. All right, so everything we do tonight, if it's gonna pass is gonna be with four votes. If it's fewer than four votes, it would not. Um, great, thank you for that. Any other clarifying questions of staff right now? I do have yes, one. Commissioner Barnes. Uh, as it relates to the nice to the slide we saw previously, and the one slide that was uh, effectively talking to um, one second, meeting purpose and recommended actions, 
it appears as though the recommended actions, and the only reason I'm be able to recite this is I screenshot it and put it up on the side here, uh, where the, the recommended action appears to want to have a bundling of uh, the resolutions into three. You've got one resolution, which is um, the first three bullets. If someone could pull that slide up on the screen, I'm sorry, that'll make it easier, but that would be possible. The one that's the meeting purpose slide, it's one understand procedurally what we're being asked to do here. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Barnes. We'll, we'll get that up in one second here. Slide five. Yes, thank you. So that I understand this, what is being uh, proposed by staff as a best practice is effectively three resolutions. Within those three resolutions are the bundles as uh, put forward here. Resolution one, you've got the first three bullets. Resolution two, you've got you know one through four. And resolution three, you're talking about the PUE abandonment. Is that what staff is calling out as a procedural best practice here for three resolutions with the content uh, as presented here? So, uh, Commissioner, yes. Uh, for uh, for projects of this kind, you want to first start with approving the environmental document. Um, um, and then, so that's why the set up the way it is. So the first action is really approving the environmental document, uh, certifying it, and then uh, adopting the MMRP um, and adopting the CEQA findings, which creates a base for then approving the project itself in its several components, which is the use permit, architectural control, so on and so forth. And then the final resolution is really a recommendation to city council. The planning commission is not being asked to take an action on the PV abandonment. So that resolution stands separately. Thank you. That was my procedural clarified question. I appreciate that. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. I'll just put a pin in that for people that didn't have the foresight to take the screenshot. I believe this crosswalks with page one and two on the staff report such that resolution number one corresponds to item number one in the staff report. Resolution number two corresponds to items two through five in the staff report. And resolution number three corresponds to item six in the staff report. So that may be easier for both commissioners and people following along um, to, to track this evening. So thank you for that, Commissioner Barnes. Any other clarifying questions um, of staff at this point? All right, with that, let's move to uh, the presentation from the EIR consultant. Thank you. Good evening, um, I'm Teresa Wallace with LSA, the city's consultant for environmental review of the proposed project. So I'm going to just go over the elements of the final EIR uh, tonight. Um, beginning with a bit of background on the overall environmental review process. And let me get my presentation set here. Bear with me. Okay, so this slide shows the overall timeline for environmental review, which began when the city issued a notice of preparation or an NOP notifying interested parties and responsible agencies that an EIR would be prepared. An initial study was also prepared and circulated with the NOP for review. All public comments received during the 30-day scoping period were considered during preparation of the draft EIR. The city and LSA and our technical specialists then prepared the draft EIR and after the close of the 45-day public comment period on April 12th, we prepared written responses 
to each substantive uh, comment received on the adequacy of the EIR analysis in what's referred to as a response to comments document. The response to comments document was published and available for review on July 30th or 10 days before this hearing, as is required by the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. So the environmental analysis for this project tiers from the Connect Menlo final EIR. The Connect Menlo EIR provides a program level analysis of the development potential envisioned for the entire city, including the increased development potential in the Bayfront area where the project site is located. This EIR evaluates the impacts of approximately 2.3 million square feet of non-residential space, 400 hotel rooms, and 4,500 residential units. The proposed project fits within the development assumptions of the Connect Menlo uh, EIR. A settlement agreement with the city of East Palo Alto requires certain projects that tier from the Connect Menlo EIR including those utilizing bonus level development like the proposed project to conduct a focused EIR with regard to housing and transportation. So environmental review of the proposed project complies with the terms of the settlement agreement. As I mentioned before, uh, an initial study was circulated with the notice that an EIR would be prepared. Based on the conclusions of the initial study, the topics shown on this slide were not further evaluated because the project is not anticipated to result in significant effects related to these issue topics or because the initial study found that these topic areas were adequately addressed through the program level EIR per, per, prepared for Connect Menlo, including mitigation measures that were identified in that EIR. So based on the analysis of the initial study, the topics of population and housing, transportation, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, and noise were further evaluated um, in the focused DIR. The slide gives an overview of the draft DIR findings for each topic. And the main takeaway is that no significant unavoidable impacts were identified and that all impacts were reduced to a less than significant level with uh, implementation of recommended mitigation measures. The EIR also evaluated a range of alternatives to the proposed project with the objective of avoiding or reducing potential impacts. While a number of alternatives were considered, the EIR included a full analysis of three alternatives, including the CEQA required no project alternative and two development alternatives as summarized on this slide. Ultimately as determined that in terms of environmental impacts, the base level alternative would be the superior alternative because it would result in reduced impacts compared to the proposed project. Although all identified impacts would be the same and the same or similar mitigation measures would be required. So this slide gives an overview of the components of the response to comments document and what is included. Five letters were received during the 45-day comment period, three from public agencies and two from individuals. The school district letter cited a number of concerns related to impacts on schools. The letter from Caltrans acknowledges the VMT analysis was conducted consistent with OPR's technical advisory and requests additional information regarding flooding in the area. And the sanitary district letter identifies infra infrastructure improvements in the vicinity of the site that would be required to serve the proposed project. Letters from individuals outline concerns related to geologic, soil, and sea level rise hazards, and overall concerns related to the merits of the project. All of these comments were responded to in writing in the response to comments document. The commission also provided comments during the draft EIR hearing and asked a number of clarifying questions, which were generally answered uh, during that hearing and are further responded to in the RTC document. Uh, this document also includes minor corrections and clarifications to the draft EIR that were made in response to comments or that were initiated by staff. 
So with uh, completion of the response to comments document, LSA and city staff determined that none of the comments on the draft EIR disclose any new significant information, no new significant or substantially more severe environmental impact impacts have been identified, and no new feasible mitigation measures or alternatives have been identified, which are considerably different from others previously analyzed and that the draft EIR did not require recirculation. So as I mentioned before, we're now considering the final EIR, which includes the draft EIR and the response to comments document, as well as the mitigation monitoring and reporting program or MMRP. The MMRP identifies all applicable mitigation measures from the initial study and the draft EIR, including applicable mitigation measures from Connect Menlo final EIR and the project specific mitigation measures. The project sponsor will be required to comply with these measures when implementing the project and the MMRP identifies the timing and oversight responsibilities for each measure. Um, so that concludes the overview of the EIR process. One final point um, that I've made before and I'll make it again um, is about the adequacy of the final EIR. Uh, the Planning Commission is being asked to decide whether or not the final EIR is adequate. Uh, the standard for adequacy of an EIR is shown on this slide. And basically, the purpose of CEQA, which is a state law, is to inform the public and decision makers of the environmental effects of a project, identify ways in which adverse environmental effects can be avoided or reduced, avoid impacts to the environment where feasible, and to disclose to the public the reasons why the lead agency may approve a project which has adverse environmental effects. The adequacy of the EIR is determined in terms of what is reasonably feasible in light of factors such as the magnitude of the project, the severity of its likely environmental impacts, and the geographic scope of the project. The Planning Commission is being asked to determine if the basic purposes of CEQA have been fulfilled and if, based on their own independent judgment, the EIR is adequate. So that concludes my presentation, and I can respond to any clarifying questions now or at the end of all the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wallace, for the work and for the presentation. We really appreciate it. For commissioners, any clarifying questions at this time? Okay. Um, and of course, we can come back with questions at the end of all the presentations or during our deliberations. Um, we'll now move to the applicant presentation as the next portion this evening. Good evening, Vice Chair Ducardi and Planning Commissioners. Um, just get the presentation up. And make sure that I have. All right. Good evening again, Vice Chair Ducardi and Planning Commissioners. Um, thank you for having us again on this project. Uh, my name is Andrew Morcos. I'm the Senior Development Director for Graystar in Menlo Park. I'm here to present Menlo Portal for entitlement approval. Um, Menlo Portal is our third project in Menlo Park and our second project uh, in the Connect Menlo Plan area. Although this presentation focuses on Menlo Portal, I thought I'd start by giving you a brief overview of Graystar in Menlo Park. Um, between our completed project, Elan Menlo Park, and our three projects uh, in entitlements, we're providing the city of Menlo Park with over 1,100 units, um, over multifamily units. Over 140 of these multifamily units will be affordable BMR units. Um, Menlo Uptown is located between uh, Jefferson and Constitution Drive and is our first project as part of the Next Menlo plan. 
Um, it, will, it was approved at Planning Commission and is going to City Council on August 31st. Menlo Flats is located on Jefferson Drive, just south of Menlo Uptown and east of, east of Chrysler, and is our third project consisting of 158 units. That project's draft EIR should be released in the next couple months. To go over some high level basic facts over the project, number one, we wanna emphasize that we've worked diligently with city staff to ensure that the project is 100% compliant with objective standards. Um, some general project info, as stated pre previously, the project consists of 335 apartment units and 35,000 square feet of commercial office space on a 3.2 acre site. Um, the project will contain 48 on-site multifamily units that will be uh, BMR. Uh, the community amenity for Menlo Portal, um, we've worked with the community uh, staff and listening to planning commissioners and others to incorporate a child care facility on site. And we have two options within that, um, that, that community amenity for planning commissioners to provide feedback on uh, in the following slide. I'll go into more detail on that. And uh, lastly, on community amenity, we have an option for Graystar to fund 100% um, of the community amenity through an in lieu fee, totaling 9.4 million, which includes a 10% administrative cost on the 8.55 million uh, community amenity. Regarding open space, uh, we're providing approximately 10,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space, excluding the outdoor childcare space just 10% that is more than is required by code. Um, this project, as far as connectivity, was not required uh, per the general plan to include a Paseo, but we have provided a connection between um, Constitution and Independence Drive to facilitate uh, pedestrian access, um, which is a st stated goal of the Connect Menlo plan. And then lastly, on environmental goals, um, Menlo Park and this project specifically is going to achieve some of the most ambitious environmental goals in the nation with uh, lead certification of both the office and the multifamily, substantial EV charging and all, all electric uh, building and on-site renewable. Um, once again, this project is 100% compliant with all objective standards. Some, um, some topics that came up in the previous planning commission study session that we wanted to address and ensure that we uh, responded to appropriately um, were bike parking. We had previously provided uh, the, num the amount of bike parking required for our 320 units and commission requested that we uh, include the number of bike parking required for 335 units. So we've done that in this new plan. Um, regarding the child, child care space, there were two um, kind of comments slash questions. Uh, one was whether the location is suitable for child care, and the second was around fencing options. Um, regarding the suitability of child care in this location, we've reached out to experts including GeoKids, Community Equity Collaborative, uh, Build Up San Mateo uh, County, Four Cs, and First Five San Mateo County, um, and they've all uh, agreed that this is a suitable and uh, important community amenity. Um, and as far as the fencing goes, we've worked in collaboration with a child care facility architect and all five, the operator, uh, we've proposed here to, prevent, to provide two fencing options that are less opaque than the previous option um, that we had provided, which will allow for some transparency between the open space and the childcare. Um, we also got a comment around the site layout um, and the property line along 111 Independence Drive. And so here we've provided a plan with both our project, Menlo Portal and 111 Independence Drive, which was approved uh, a few months ago. You'll notice um, at Independence Drive, uh, right here, the grades are matching. And so we are able to coordinate our landscaping, um, paving and any trees in this location to ensure a cohesive design. Um, our two sites eventually have to be different grades because of uh, requirements around FEMA floodplain 
levels. So um, or along the red line, there's about a four inch difference between the two sites. And we've included the site fencing, which is attractive, but accomplishes um, what is needed, uh, which is a bit of separation between these sites along the grade and along kind of what is the back end of both the projects. To go into a bit more detail on the child care fencing options, you'll see these two options we have here. We're happy to hear comments on either of these. These are both substantially less opaque and more transparent than the previous options. Um, again, they'll be facing the publicly accessible open space uh, between the uh, non-residential uh, garage and the multifamily, um, multifamily building. So we're happy to hear uh, any feedback here. We've worked with um, a child care architect and all five to ensure that these are both safe, accomplish what is required for uh, the outdoor space and um, provide at least some transparency between um, the child care and the open space. Next, I wanna go through the community, community amenity in a bit more detail. Uh, within the child care option, we have two options for planning commission um, consideration. Option one essentially has all 8.55 million going to um, child care operator, all five, which is a national, national association um, for the education of young children accredited organization. Um, 2.8, approximately 2.8 million is attributed to the real estate value in the facility. Uh, another 360,000 is attributed to the build out costs. And this final 5.4 million is where we've provided an option based on feedback. In the first option, the whole 5.4 million goes to tuition subsidy for all five. And in the second option, a portion of the 5.4 million, about 2 million, goes to tuition, student tuition subsidy. And the remaining um, funds goes to the city in lieu fee fund. And that includes a 10% administrative cost um, that, to, that is required per the city's in lieu fee ordinance. Um, lastly, as I previously stated, Graystar is retaining the option to pay 100% in lieu fee, which totals 9.4 million, inclusive of, it, of the 10% in, uh, in lieu fee administrative fee required. Um, our proposed BMR mix, um, we have two options similar to what we provided for Uptown Housing Commission. Uh, did request that we provided an equivalent alternative that um, provided very low, low and moderate income units. Um, so that is our alternative two. Alternative two includes three very low income units, uh, 14 low income units and 31 moderate income units. And alternative one includes all low income units um, at, at 48 of them. And as a reminder, um, all these units will uh, be located on site and will uh, be indistinguishable from the market rate units. Um, next, we wanna show some renderings of the project. Um, this is facing Southeast from approximately Marsh Road heading to Bayfront. The three-story non-residential building is in the forefront with the seven-story um, residential building in the background. Um, next rendering is a uh, look straight on from Independence Drive to the multifamily building on the left and the non-residential building on the right with the child care facility located at the bottom left-hand corner of the non-residential building. And lastly, this is a look from within the publicly accessible open space the child care um, outdoor space would be to the left and the remaining space would be publicly accessible open space would be <clears throat> on residential building to the left and the residential building to the right. Um, with that, uh, I did just want to correct the, there was um, in the agenda, um, the comment period I believe was misstated and I just wanna correct that it actually started from February 25th and ended on uh, April 14th. And the draft EIR 
uh, planning commission comment um, comment study session was on um, 3-22-21. So for the record, just wanted to add that. I believe the dates that were stated were for uh, Menlo Uptown, our previous project. Um, so with that, I wanted to say thank you to Planning Commission, to the community for spending hours upon hours with us on this project, improving the project with their time and effort and passion around um, these different issues. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Clark Manis from Heller Manis, uh, who's our lead architect here, and Karen Perliski from uh, PGA, who's our landscape architect here. Uh, Clark will take it away to go through some of the architecture and site design. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I want to say good evening to Chair Pro Tem DeCarty and the fellow commissioners. So I want to start by thanking you all for your contributions to what has evolved into a very exciting project with a great site plan and some building designs. The images that Andrew has shared with you, I do believe capture the exciting visual character while, as he said, are, are being consistent with the objective standards. So on this ground floor plan, the multifamily residential and the commercial offices both embrace the creation of what Andrew described earlier as the pocket park, in addition to the Paseo that's on the east side of the site. The sea level rise criteria again elevated the ground level of the buildings and has been accommodated in the design. Mechanized parking systems are concealed along the streets uh, with active pedestrian frontages concealing um, their visibility. And publicly accessible open space seemingly integrates with both building types in a really nice way. So as Andrew said, Karen will be able to touch further on the landscape elements and our coordination on the ground plane with regard to the adjacent multifamily project. Next. So the residential units again begin at the second floor. The residential character is reflected in the uh, renderings that you saw earlier on the Independence Constitution Street frontages, uh, while it also does a great job of concealing this very advanced parking system. Next. The third level plan, which is the courtyard plan for the residential, is C-shaped in plan and the multifamily floor plan rises five levels above from the courtyard plan. On the east side, across the pocket park, is the Saul Building's office floor plate for that particular user. Next. So touching again on materials, on the building materials, the multifamily building combines both the contrasting primary color rain screen panels with light colored smooth plaster. The building corners where there are site intersections are expressed with a bold materiality. And we believe that the setbacks, the balconies and the bay windows all provide additional facade character. Next. And on the office building, we've created a materiality palette, which we believe harmoniously integrates with the residential character by creating a unified site expression in the design. The bronze colored clad glass uh, window wall sits on top of the articulated metal screen that conceals the parking in the garage. And next, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Karen, who can talk about the open space in a little bit more detail. I don't think we can hear you. Karen appears to be unmuted, but does Vaughn or Leo need to provide her more access? This is Leo with staff. It looks like she's showing as unmuted, but it may be something on her end, on Karen's end. I don't know, Karen, if you're able to log out of the meeting and log back in, that sometimes tends to work with applicants. 
And Leah, let me just, I'll uh, pinch hit for Karen. She's available then to answer any more detailed questions. So I'll touch on the items that, that she was gonna talk to if I could. Um, so one of the things that the team worked on very closely was the character and the quality of the open space, which Karen and PGA did. Uh, one of the things that the commission asked and has been underway, as Andrew said earlier, is the opportunity to find a way to integrate the uh, adjacencies that, the, at the top uh, where they, they meet and the bottom or on the right side, uh, both EV lanes and other access points sort of limit what we want to do. But as Aaron, Aaron, as, excuse me, as Andrew said earlier, we've created a sort of informal path through there. So I just wanted to sort of reiterate that, that we heard the importance of trying to provide a, a coordination with regard to the buildings on that block. Thank you, Mr. Manis. Mr. Marcos, aside from the connectivity issues, other parts of your presentation? Yeah, or... I just want to correct that this is actually Constitution Drive here um, and Independence Drive is here. I was saying Independence um, incorrectly. So thank you all again. Apologize for the connectivity issues, but we're happy to and ready to answer any questions. Good. Thank you, Mr. Marcos, and to the entire team for uh, putting together the presentation and for the multiple times before us. Any clarifying questions at this time for commissioners? Um, recognizing the next up is public comment and then our opportunity for both questions and deliberation. Any clarifying questions for the applicant? All right, none at this moment. Thank you to the whole team. So at this point, I uh, will move on our suggested pathway through this agenda item to public comment. Um, any member of the public may identify themselves and speak uh, for up to three minutes in any aspect of this project. Um, let me again turn it over to Mr. Tapia to guide us through um, providing people access. Thank you, Vice Chair DeCarty. Good evening, members of the commission and members of the public. If you do have a comment at this time, please feel free to click on the raised hand feature icon on your screen. It should be at the bottom of your screen. If you go ahead and click on that, that'll notify staff that you do have a comment. Alternatively, if you are listening to this meeting via telephone, if you go ahead and click star nine on your uh, keypad, that'll also notify staff that you do have a comment at this time. And currently, Vice Chair DeCarty, I am seeing a couple of commenters. So with your permission, I will start introducing them as they come in. Oh, please do. Please. Actually, um, pro tem chair, this is um, Eric Phillips with the city attorney's office. Before we start taking comments, if, since this is a public hearing, um, if you could just formally open the public hearing and then at the conclusion of public comment, we'll close the hearing. Great, I will do that. Um, let me now formally open the public hearing. Um, thank you, Council Phillips. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will go ahead and introduce the first speaker. Again, if you can just please state your first and last name, uh, where you live or where you reside or your organization affiliation. So I will go ahead and choose the first one. Again, forgive me if I mispronounce any names, but you'll have an opportunity to clearly state your first and last name. So the first one I am showing is James Rugimez. Again, forgive me if I mispronounce this. You should have the ability now to go ahead and activate your microphone. Good evening, honorable commission members, hardworking city staff, presenters, members of the public. My name is James Rigomez. I'm speaking on behalf of the San Mateo Building and Construction Trade Council. San Mateo Building and Construction Trade Council is comprised of 25 affiliate unions and 16,000 highly skilled men and women, many of them with, live in Menlo Park. Uh, I have a few questions. One is, um, does the developer have a general contractor selected? Um, is prevailing wage triggered because of um, affordable housing funding, as well as the public utility easement being consumed by the project? Does that trigger prevailing wage? Um, I would like, to, if prevailing wage is triggered by that, I would like to 
let the commissioners know that they have an opportunity to create good policy by converting a prevailing wage job, uh, prevailing wage, wage theft is the number one crime against US workers today, not only in construction, but in all fields and convert um, the prevailing wage into a community workforce agreement. Community workforce agreements set the wages standards and conditions and follow the work and family platform of the worker earn a decent wage, even though we earn a decent wage, half our money goes to rents and mortgages. Healthcare, not only for the member, but also for their family, raising the quality of life for all, for their whole family. Uh, retirement dollars that are reinvested back into our community through municipal bonds, so it's a way to recycle the money. And finally, we fund one of the largest privately funded education systems in these United States through our apprenticeship program to ensure that we have a skilled and trained workforce to build the project right the first time on time and on budget. With a project this size, I don't see the contractor developer not utilizing our highly skilled men and women. Uh, there is one other option that the developer, um, and I would encourage you to strongly encourage the developer to write a letter of intent to the Building Trade Council stating that they will build this project with 100% um, work and family platform contractors and members. Um, my office, I am available to Graystar for any conversations. I have sample letters of intents that I have received from other developers in the city of Menlo Park. There are a tremendous amount of private developers that commit to uh, our working families through uh, this type of community workforce agreement, formerly known as PLAs. When people ask me what unions are, I, tell, I say that they are working families standing together and we would like to ask the city of Menlo Park before they get a development agreement that you guys stand with our working families. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Okay, uh, Vice Chair DeCardi, I will go ahead and introduce the next speaker. So it looks like we have Christine Padilla. Again, if you can just please state your first and last name for the record the political jurisdiction in which you live in or your organizational affiliation. You should have the ability now to activate your microphone. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Christine Padilla and I'm the director of Build Up San Mateo County. We're an initiative designed to preserve, grow and improve the supply of childcare. We, along with our leadership partners, the four C's and first site five submitted a letter of support for citing childcare at Menlo Portal. I wanted to speak tonight to highlight some of the additional benefits of co-locating childcare and housing projects together. Um, the proximity of the project nearby employers, as well as under-resourced communities makes this proposal particularly well positioned to greatly benefit working families. As you're aware, Menlo Park has a growing shortage of childcare and due to the pandemic, this shortage will only grow. With 63% of children ages zero to 12 having parents who both work outside of the home, access to childcare is critical to the pandemic recovery and the ability for residents to return to work. This facility will fulfill a critical void in the community's early learning infrastructure. Finding suitable sites for early learning in this competitive real estate market is the number one barrier to opening new childcare programs. Not only will the project bring new housing, but the project sponsor has worked diligently to identify amenities to benefit Belhaven. And one amenity is a high quality early learning center for our youngest learners. My understanding and also from confirmed just now from the presentation is that this will be part of an overall $8.55 million community benefits package. Um, we're extremely excited to see a state of the art early learning facility complete with bathroom facilities and outdoor play space being um, constructed, furnished and built out. Um, this along with the promise of a long lease would allow community-based nonprofit child care center like all five to expand and continue their outstanding services to the children and their families. Buildup has been working with Graystar and other developers in Redwood City and South San Francisco on including child care in all new developments and we're very hopeful more cities will follow suit as this is an amazing opportunity to include this amenity that's so needed throughout our whole county. I urge you to support this project and thank you for your thoughtful consideration of child care use at this site and throughout Menlo Park. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Padilla. OK, 
Okay, so I will go ahead and introduce the next speaker. So it looks like we have Heather Hopkins. Again, if you can just clearly uh, state your first and last name for the record, the political jurisdiction in which you live in or your organization affiliation. You should have the ability to activate your microphone now. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Heather Hopkins. I'm with a nonprofit organization here in Menlo Park called Community Equity Collaborative. We focus on equity projects, um, particularly in the early childhood education field. And I also happen to own a preschool um, in unincorporated Menlo Park and um, put a lot of details in our letter, but just wanted to call in and reiterate how excited we are about the child care use of this site and our strong support. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Hopkins. Thank you. So at this time, I'll go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Looks like we have Pam Jones. Again, if you can just please state your first and last name for the record. Political jurisdiction for your organization affiliation. You should have the ability now to activate your microphone. Good evening and thank you. And I first want to express my gratitude to the staff who has been so diligent in letting me know when these projects come up and where they are in the process. My name is Pamela Jones. I'm a resident of Menlo Park and I live in District 1. Um, I realized my letter, <laughs> I knew what I was saying, but some of it may have been a little, little challenging for, for you. Um, but essentially what I was trying to say is, yes, we need to have childcare in that area. Um, if there's gonna be 1,200, over 1,200 new units, yes, you're gonna need childcare. But this project does not fit within the amenities that was brought to the city by the Bellhaven Visioning in 2013, and I attached a link, nor is it part of what is in the adopted amenities um, because it is talking about the relationship between Ravenswood City School District and Bellhaven, um, unless I miss something. Um, I, for one, uh, believe that we need to just put this money into uh, the Inlu fee in a fund that will pay the difference for below market rate apartments. Um, the in lieu fee would cover over $4,000 in a monthly subsidy for a two bedroom unit for eight years. And that would cover give or take 24 units. Now, my math may be flawed, but I think you understand the intention. In my mind, this is how we change the concept of penciling in, penciling out. Um, this is a way to allow housing for the very modest income. Um, in addition, it would be meeting the, uh, assist the city in meeting the obligation under the current or future housing element because we have a se severe deficit in uh, providing housing for the very low, low and moderate income. Um, the other piece that, that I need to remind you of is that I do come from a thought process thinking of the process of how we do things. And I've said it before, I'll say it again, we are working with a flawed document, um, the Connect Menlo General Plan. And all the meetings that I was in, the developers drove the process as we see by all of the, uh, the zoning changes. But we did not do anything about uh, SB 1000, which is the environmental justice element. And the odd thing that I found is that PlaceWorks worked on both Connect Finlo as well as SP 1000. So again, um, figure out money from someplace else for the child care that probably won't be accessible to Bellhaven uh, residents and put the in loop fee into a fund so it will benefit the Bellhaven residents now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you for that comment. So I will go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Looks like we have Lynn Bramlett. Again, just please clearly state your first and last name for the record, political jurisdiction which you live in or your organization, organizational affiliation. You should have the ability to activate your microphone now, Lynn. Good evening, Commission. I'm Lynn Bramlett. I live in District 3. And I find it so ironic that we're hearing this uh, discussion tonight, the same night the library hosted reporter Kate uh, Bradshaw's to talk about her uneven ground series, which was about putting less desirable development near communities of color, 
which is exactly what happened in District 1 via the Connect Menlo process. And I agree 100% with Ms. Jones that we are moving ahead based on a flawed premise. And I wanna talk a little bit more about that and also mention that I think people realize there's a flawed premise, but what we do about it is the question. For example, at the Housing Commission meeting uh, last week, it noted that District 1 has 3,192 housing units in the pipeline. And that's almost the entire full Menlo Park Rena allotment. So District 1 continues to see development going forward. And the question is, what are we doing about it? In terms of Connect Menlo, I've read the documents, including the ones that led to it. And the, the vision was a vision to make money for Menlo Park to replace the money the city lost when the state pulled the plug on redevelopment agencies. It's very explicit in multiple staff reports. And the program level EIR that I keep hearing about at these meetings, how it set forth a vision for Menlo Park, um, it, it needs a thorough review now. It found all kinds of serious environmental problems, but um, it went ahead for the benefits the, the benefits outweigh the impact and the benefits, the number one is economic benefit. It also had quote environmental benefits and even social benefits. <laughs> and then the documents that the program level EIR is based on in the Connect Menlo need to be looked at today for their promises that aren't being followed and for new information that we know. I'm reading one right here where it says under the general plan, the city is required to implement the general plan programs related to geologic and seismic hazards over the duration of the general plan build out. So then it talks about different reports the city is supposed to run, et cetera. And I don't believe that's happening. And this document, Geology, Soils and Seismicity, it did not adequately cover the threat from a major eruption of the Hayward Fault, which the city council uh, heard, heard about roughly two years ago. We also have sea level rise, which is coming more rapidly and seawalls don't keep out groundwater, which is also rising. So all these flawed documents need to be reviewed before we keep continuing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bramlett. At this time, uh, Vice Chair DeCardi, I'm not seeing any other public comments. Let's give that a moment for anybody else who was thinking of jumping in and now realizes this may be the moment. Okay, anybody in the queue? I can confirm there are no other comments. Terrific, thank you. Uh, let me close public comment and actually check with Council Phillips. At what point am I closing the public hearing? So at, when we have no more speakers, you can close the public hearing and take it back to the Planning Commission for deliberations and any clarifying questions that you and the commissioners have. Terrific. You said that better than I could, so we'll do exactly that right now. Um, so it is now to the portion of the program for commissioners for any clarifying questions or comments. Um, and I will remind us again that the Expected action items for us are on pages one and two of the staff report, items one through six. Um, and as discussed earlier, uh, potentially identifying item one uh, with its three subcomponents as a resolution, items two through five as a resolution, and item six as a resolution because we're advisory on that element. But with that, let me turn it over to any commissioner. Commissioner Riggs. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to follow up on an issue that Ms. Jones raised. Uh, and 
ask Ms. Baguette if uh, uh, if the child care proposal uh, does indeed fit within the amenities list as we currently understand it. Um, yeah, I mean, when the project was brought forward uh, to this commission, um, the staff had posed a specific question in March about uh, finding that the child care would fit into the educational um, facility provided for Belhaven community, which is one of the uh, items on the community amenities list. So in that sense, uh, providing the child care and the financial subsidy, both options would comply with the community amenities list as it currently stands. Thank you. And then uh, in terms of uh, transit, I think it's fair to say that to get from, um, oh, say, Sevier Avenue over to this proposed child care center at eight o'clock in the morning would be challenging. Uh, similarly, at uh, 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, did you discuss with the, uh, or, or have you heard any suggestion from the applicant regarding um, a shuttle or other uh, transit opportunity in order to make this location actually available um, to Bellhaven residents? Uh, we have not had uh, that kind of discussion with the applicant, um, uh, but I would uh, punt this question to, uh, uh, to the applicant and see if they have had any conversation uh, on their end to provide any shuttle service or other ways of accessing the site. So we have, we are working with the city and this is in the staff report to provide a drop off and pick up zone in front of the child care area. And um, although I don't know the exact route, I know they are, there are Menlo Park shuttles that, uh, that go to this area and they aren't uh, extremely frequent, but they do frequent this area. And I think part of the issue here is um, the chicken or the egg. There are not residential units here. There's just starting to be a significant amount of office here. Um, and so as more residential units and office are built, it feels like that we can ad advocate um, as a group for more shuttle service or bus service to serve this area. So in terms of uh, the origin uh, being over in Bellhaven, not what is going to be built here in uh, our Bayshore development area, when the childcare is open, um, would it be feasible to have an arrangement to provide a shuttle between the child care location and a at least one, I, I would say more than one, two or three uh, pickup locations in Bellhaven. I we have not considered that or looked into it, and so I hesitate <laughs> um, to give you a, a yes or no on that. But I, I think we would be happy to look into it. Okay, great. Uh, I think that could be an important concept. Thank you. Um, I guess while I have the mic, I will also ask, um, and uh, while I have you online, Mr. Marcos, you had asked for uh, an alternate location for just a few of the short-term bike uh, parking spots. Would the alternate locations be related to alternate building entries at the office building? 
Um, you know, they're just beyond the 50 foot um, requirement by code. And so they relate across the site. I, I don't know if um, uh, Planner Pyle Bagot has any additional information on those. Um, I don't remember the exact locations of those uh, bike parking spaces and where they are. Oh, okay. Um, so I think the the commission's interest would be in how attractive these locations would be. Um, and I think uh, as, a, as a former bicyclist to anywhere and everywhere, I will say that we take the shortest route and go to the nearest uh, terminus. Um, so uh, that isn't necessarily the main entry of the office building. It might be, well, it might be the entry to uh, the residential building lobby. It might be to an alternative entry to the building. I don't know whether people will be using other entries. Um, as um, I have on um, buildings of three stories and less, uh, I personally used alternative exits. Uh, to go up to my desk, but uh, I must say not on um, on taller buildings. Um, so I, I don't know if it's considered <clears throat> viable, particularly if you end up with multiple tenants in the office building. And I will be honest, I don't recall uh, if there are is an alternate entry to the residential building other than through the front. Yeah, so to answer your question, the, the bike parking spaces that we're requesting for a waiver from are more than 50 feet from any entry into the building, but there are still substantial short term parking bike parking spaces within the 50 feet. And so this is just for a small portion of those that are required. Okay, uh, so Ms. Bagat, do you have any um... Uh, input on the optimal locations for uh, these five that don't appear to work out very well in terms of planning at the front entry? So um, to clarify Andrew's point, uh, there are about 14 short-term bike parking spaces that are above what our zoning code requires. So the project provides more short-term bicycle parking spaces than we currently require. So that's one point. And of the 14 spaces that are additional, there are five spaces that are just a little bit outside of the 50 foot zone of influence uh, from a main entrance or the side entrance. So every side of the building on 111 and Constitution uh, on, on the independent side, excuse me, and constitution side has entries in at various portions uh, of the building. But this is both for the office and the residential portion. And there are short term bicycle spaces provided near the entrance, like really close by. But these five spaces are just a little bit further away. And when I say little bit, I, I mean, you know, 10, 15 feet uh, range uh, further away from, uh, from that simply because there is other strong water facilities, landscaping, other things that are uh, kind of prohibitive of having these extra spaces located within the 50 feet buffer zone from an entry. Does that right. answer your question? It certainly does. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And then, um, just as long as I have the mic again, uh, just to clarify, of the um, uh, shall we say findings that uh, you want to hear from the commission tonight, we would adopt three resolutions. Uh, I presume we would include the updates, uh, ed editing updates that you mentioned at the beginning of uh, this project um, and uh, 
And finding that the EIR is adequate, I believe is one of, in one of the three resolutions um, is, um, are the lot mergers included as part of the use permit? The lot mergers and the lot line um, adjustment is really an administrative action. So uh, that is uh, something that we are presenting to the planning commission because it is part of the project request. However, planning commission is not the authority to take any action on the, on the lot merger or the lot line adjustment. So once there is a vote on this project, the lot merger and lot line adjustment will be reviewed by our engineering staff, um, make sure they're in compliance with the requirements and um, basically approved at staff level. All right, that explains their absence. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Other commissioners, questions or comments? So I, I have a couple of comments um, about the amenity uh, childcare. I think it's a fantastic idea, um, but I do side with um, Ms. Jones um, on this one. I, I think that, that we are like going in this circle, even though we have a little more clarity uh, from council about amenities, but I feel like we're still running around kind of like a hamster wheel, uh, so to speak, because amenities were supposed to be for the Bellhaven community, not for Bayfront community that is being built. And I do agree that it will be difficult with uh, Commissioner Riggs. It's not going to be easy for people to get there from Bellhaven. And I really see this as being serving to the um, Graystar communities and not to Bellhaven. Um, also, uh, the BMR mix, um, I, I do wish that there were larger units for uh, low income uh, instead of all of those falling into moderate. Uh, and those are, are just my couple of comments for now. Thank you, Commissioner Tate. Other commissioner questions or comments? Commissioner Harris. Thank you, Vice Chair DeCarty. Uh, I have a couple of questions and comments. Um, I too would like to thank Ms. Jones um, for her questions and uh, or for her comments about the community amenity and the child care. <clears throat> um, and I wanted to ask uh, if we decided that all of the funds um, for the community amenity should be in lieu funds, the 9.4 million, I think it is, um, how, who decides how and when that money is spent? I guess that's a question for staff. And can it, can it go, you know, can it go to help fund um, uh, housing for uh, others who may not qualify for the BMR or are not lucky enough to get it? So I can start, I can take that question. Uh, Thank you. So the, the in-lieu fee, that's something the council recently initiated, went through the adoption process. It just took effect uh, a few weeks ago. Well, ultimately staff will need to put together um, kind of the in-lieu fee fund and kind of identify through a public process what projects would be, um, the fund would contribute to. So ultimately that's gonna be uh, a broader discussion with the community and the council. So. I think it's kind of open-ended right now to answer your question in terms of what those could be used for. Um, ultimately, we'd be looking at the um, what is identified as community amenities and using the fund to provide those versus applicants or individual projects providing them through a city-driven process. And would it would those funds need to remain um, per commissioner's Tate per commissioner's Tate thought about 
would they have to be, um, excuse me, would they have to be maintained for the benefit of the Bellhaven community and not be sort of spread other places? Yeah, in, in that ordinance, there certainly is a direct correlation, if you will, um, for those funds to be used more directly um, for the Bellhaven community, District 1. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have another general question about the communities amenities list um, and, uh, and how I realize it, it applies to this project, but to others. Um, a number of folks have said, <clears throat> we've got comments that it does, it is a list that's, that's come, I think, created in 2014 or 2015, and a lot has changed since then. And I'm just wondering, is there um, a plan to move, or to redo that or to, um, to come up with a different community amenities list? So I, I apologize, I missed the first part of your question, but I think I got it from the second part. Uh, so in April, the city council had a, held a study session on the community amenities um, that were adopted, the list that was adopted as part of the general plan update uh, commonly referred to as Connect Menlo. And so there was some discussion through that study session. Ultimately, there will need to be a community driven process to update the list um, that, that we will need to take on through staff at the direction of the council. Um, so that, that will have a public outreach component that will take um, some time. Okay. Okay, and then I just, I would like to agree um, that, that I think the childcare, while it's definitely gonna be needed, um, needs to serve the Bellhaven community residents. And I'm not sure that, you know, it, perhaps adding a shuttle, I, don't, I just, I, I know if I were a parent with small children that were going to childcare, I wouldn't wanna get on the shuttle to go to the childcare place and then pick up my kid and then get back on another shuttle to get back home and do that twice. Um, so I'm just, I'm just not sure how well that's going to connect to the Bellhaven community. And that's, that's what I have for now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Harris. Um, Commissioner Tate, is it a brief sort of comment? Otherwise, I also want to make sure that Commissioner Barnes is, um, is recognized. So yeah, Commissioner this Tate. is brief. I, I just yeah. wanted to, um, to applaud uh, uh, Gray Star for the urgent care. And even though it is in that area, it's, it's, a, totally different, uh, it's a totally different beast. And I just want to make sure that, you know, to, to just say that, that I really did appreciate that addition as a community amenity, um, but, but this is definitely, uh, uh, you know, a different ball of wax. Thank you, Vice Chair, for letting me speak again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for those not familiar, that's the other Graystar project community amenity that was uh, uh, before us, uh, whatever that was a month ago. So yes. Commissioner Barnes. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I have a question through, I suspect to the developer as it relates to the student tuition subsidy associated with option one and option two for the community amenity for the child care. And it may be somewhat of an operational question, but I'd like to understand a little bit about the numbers. Should we vote for 2 million or should we vote for not should, but in the in the case that we vote for a $2 million subsidy versus a $5.4 million subsidy, what does the increased subsidy mean for the operational outlook of the facility of the of this as an operating entity? And what, you know, how did is this are these numbers created uh, how do these numbers vision out in terms of um, why two million might be appropriate, why five million might be appropriate? What's the plus or the benefit uh, or the minus of these different numbers? If someone could talk a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess these options came about once the in lieu fee ordinance was passed. I just wanna kind of give everyone a brief history here, which is that the in lieu fee option wasn't an option 
um, until about two months ago when the council passed the in lieu fee ordinance. And so up until that time, developers in this area were required to provide uh, a community amenity that was on the amenity list that various commissioners and others have mentioned that was passed in 2016. And that is a limited list um, with several of those amenities already kind of called for and others have been stated by the community that um, aren't appropriate, such as infrastructure in the area. And so given that limited list, um, we felt uh, childcare was an appropriate uh, amenity. And, and I apologize, Barnes, uh, Commissioner Barnes, I will get to the question, but I did wanna clarify also that um, admittance to the child care facility is preferred to Bellhaven residents as well as staff is preferred for Bellhaven residents as well. So there is an attempt to make this a direct link to um, the Bellhaven area. Um, the amounts between the 2 million and the 5.4 million, we worked very closely with all five um, to determine kind of what was uh, an appropriate split that would allow them to get their operation up and running. And 2 million approximately covers uh, the operations for about four years. And the 5.4 million goes for approximately 10 years. And um, from conversations with all five, the two million and four years gives them enough time to get the childcare in this location up and running and also to fundraise because that's um, one of the main ways that they fund um, their childcare operations that exist in Bellhaven today and they would fund this new operation here. Um, just as a reminder, the other way that they fund uh, operations is 50% of the students admitted are fully subsidized, meaning they don't pay anything. Um, and 25% on top of that are subsidized on a sliding scale. And then the remaining 25% pay market rate. And so some of that market rate um, does go to benefit the overall uh, operation. So I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as I try to break down this community amenity discussion, I'm going to talk about my thoughts, I guess, in two different boxes. One is the procedural box, and the procedural box relates to the uh, community amenity list that we have. And clearly it calls out social service improvement, it calls out education improvements in Bellhaven, it calls out improvements to the quality of student education experience in Bellhaven. And we did have a discussion. So I believe that uh, childcare fits squarely into this box. Uh, and, I, and I won't even get into, well, I will later get into why uh, childcare is so fundamentally important to our communities. Um, but just from a procedural box, uh, this is in the wheelhouse of the community amenities. This is on a list that I know it's, you know, somewhat um, it, it, fashionable to uh, not be a fan of this a community amenity list. And at the time that this community amenity list was created, it was an extensive outreach into the community. It was, it was the ability to find not only the couple voices that are uh, vocal in the community, but going much deeper into the Spanish language community in finding the outreach and going out and getting folks to contribute to this list. So this list, while, and I invite, and I'm happy, uh, you know, for whatever efforts it may be to update it, this is not, uh, I don't believe having seen it be created, a flawed list for what it was and what it represents for the community. So I take that, I take this list, I take this falling into the wheelhouse uh, of that list, and then I go to, you know, is this, uh, is this right 
for the community. You know, you know, if I kind of break down that argument, you know, I look at the the discussion about, or I hear discussion about location, and is it, are we going to find people coming uh, across from the Belhaven uh, community into here? Well, when the option is uh, no child care, when the option is having uh, no child care or driving a lot farther because there isn't other child care in the community, uh, this is uh, the best local option for child care. This is a child care that has built into it the subsidies, which are absolutely critical for the operation of, of, of this child care, not only from an operating budget standpoint, but from the standpoint of staff retention. In order to retain the type of staff you need to teach there, you need to have income streams which show it as a viable entity. That is the problem with more institutional childcare. You don't have that, uh, the ability to retain staff, you don't have the ability to do the professional development because you don't have the money and you don't have the site for it. So what we have here is a very unique opportunity to site uh, in a uh, new build facility, uh, this childcare with subsidies and any day of the week, any month of the year, I will take childcare over any infrastructure improvement that involves uh, concrete or utility lines or the rest of it. I think that we uh, owe it to the longer term viability of this community, not what are we gonna spend next year or the following year of the in Luffy and how are we gonna spend it, rather to overlook this opportunity to foundationally benefit the community with childcare, which does not current exist, currently exist in this iteration with this potential funding source, uh, I think is a grievous um, mistake. So I can't be any more full-throated in terms of my support for this there at this moment uh, as it relates to, to childcare. Um, Tell some other uh, comments on the project, but I'll uh, stop there uh, on this topic. Thank you. Commissioner Riggs. Thank you, Vice Chair DeCardi. Um, first of all, uh, I, I want to thank Mr. Barnes for um, his uh, impassioned and enlightened comments, uh, putting, I think, uh, our choices in perspective. Having initiated the question among us about whether this uh, location was accessible to the Bellhaven community, I rather belatedly pulled up the map. Um, I don't know if I can do this or for that matter, whether I'll get in trouble. Uh, oh, well, I can't share screen unless the host allows me to, um, uh, just to uh, show a Google map of the area. But um, it appears that from, uh, oh, say, Carlton and Newbridge or Carlton and Ivy, uh, one would take Ivy to Chilco Street and predominantly the, the route would be to take Chilco Street up to Constitution and then across and over. And I have to confess uh, with my you know, prejudice against Bayshore Expressway, I think that we all have, um, I'd rather forgotten that potentially there uh, are other routes um, to connect these locations. I also, um, thinking in terms of context, um, thinking in terms of alternatives, for example, if we uh, could magically serve the Bellhaven community, I believe uh, two of the highest priorities would be either a pharmacy or a decent sized grocery store. Um, both of which are being proposed in another location that is perhaps more amenable. But if, it, if 
this applicant uh, were to be pressed um, to provide either one of those, the, the square footage and the population, I don't believe would support them at this time. Um, I mean, North Fair Oaks goes to uh, Duluki's Market, which is just uh, um, maybe uh, 300 yards down Marsh Road. And, um, <clears throat> and I really don't know whether a pharmacy is a realistic location here uh, in this mixed use project that would serve a large area. And, and then it would have the same transportation problem that we do with childcare, um, unless you limit your pharmacy visits to in between the commute hours, which I, I never did. I did all of my um, errands before and after the commute hour. So um, this is to say that while I brought up significant doubts about this location and whether it would serve, I'm now wondering if that wasn't a bit hasty. I have always felt um, as Ms. Tate expressed and as Mr. Barnes expressed that childcare is a needed, significantly needed use throughout Menlo Park and throughout the peninsula. I mean, we have seen numbers, uh, the demand versus what is available are just, you know, just not on the same page. And so at this point, I, I, I think I just want to share that um, I'm leaning towards support of the childcare proposal and indeed would probably be against the alternative or the option to have the alternative to convert it into cash, given that politics of the moment can lead to free cash being assigned to the um, heartfelt movement of the moment. And I would not want to see that money go to something that is declared to be good for all people of Menlo Park, if not the world, and therefore is a benefit to Bellhaven and therefore qualifies. Not, I think in this case, and not for the Connect Menlo area. Um, uh, so uh, that actually is the only other comment that I have on this project. Um, since we've had, uh, a couple of opportunities to look at this project. And I think it's very well put together. And I think it's evident uh, that Mr. Marcos and his design team have worked very hard and very much in good faith um, on this project. So um, I'm at this point comfortable and supportive. Thank you. Commissioner Tate. Um, I can someone confirm for me, uh, because I believe that all five has a project expansion project in Bellhaven now, where Bellhaven uh, residents have have a priority. I'm not sure. I can confirm that, Commissioner Tate. It's at 1391 uh, Chilco Drive, and it's uh, an agreement with Ravenswood City School to expand their current space. And so this would be another expansion in a slightly different location. Sorry, I muted myself. Thank you for, for uh, confirming that. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Barnes. I have no intention of front running any uh, other commentary from my fellow commissioners. Um, I am prepared to walk through the resolutions <laughs> for the project and make motions and see, um, you know, see how they land. Uh, I've. Um... I don't see any reason not to, Commissioner Barnes, based on the comment and, and 
walking them through making motions does not preclude any commissioner from both commenting or asking further questions. So by all means, proceed as you see fit. Absolutely, thank you. And, and I've always in, I've always appreciated um, the procedure where, you know, just because there's a motion on the floor does not in any way cut off uh, vigorous discussion as we go along and talk about resolutions. Um, so looking at the recommended, uh, looking at the actions and looking at the uh, resolutions, uh, first, I will make a motion uh, to based on that, based on us having seen this project multiple times for multiple years, I don't feel that there's stones unturned related to the project. So that's why I'm comfortable at this stage making the motion. Uh, we spent hours, a uh, great deal of time on this project, thankfully, and so, you know, for good reason. Uh, so the first resolution is certifying the final environmental impact report, uh, adopting the mitigation monitoring and reporting program and adopting the CEQA findings. So for that first resolution, uh, I make a motion to approve. Yeah, Commissioner Barnes, maybe I'll just as a point of process, we did have a recommendation from I think well laid out by um, Planner Bagat to think about this in three steps. And I think you're headed that way, which is the first one was to consider the EIR. With that approval, that becomes the basis for then moving on items two through five. Um, is that where you're headed, Commissioner Barnes, to suggest that we look at the EIR now and, and uh, move on that? That we could then well, move that all the way through and then do the rest? Or did you wanna um, put them together? Thank you. I, uh, and again, with my handy screenshot, uh, looking at adopt a resolution, um, there's three that are bundled together. If I, and those three that are bundled together are the FEIR, MMRP, and the secret findings together as a resolution to work through all three of those. So Great. working with the bundling that was proposed, uh, it would be that first of three resolutions inclusive in the first resolution of these three pieces. Which correlates to item one in the staff report, which puts all three of those together if people are following on the staff report. All right, so we have a motion from Commissioner Barnes um, to move on the three elements that are related to the EIR um, as presented in the staff presentation um, in an item one in the staff report. Do we have a second or a comment or response? I see uh, Council Phillips has come online. Do you have a? Oh, I, just as point of order, um, before the motion is is considered or deliberated, um, we just need to have the second. So, if there's a, a second for Commissioner Barnes's motion, then the commissioners can take up discussion and and further deliberations of the motion. Sorry if I wasn't clear. That was my intent, and uh, so thank you for clarifying. Um, yes, Commissioner Riggs. Um, that's how I read your request, and I would second the motion. All right, so we have a first from Commissioner Barnes, a second from Commissioner Riggs. Um, for my way of working this through, it's essentially um, that we would, under the staff recommendation on page one in the staff report, make the required findings per. CEQA and certify the final environmental impact report that analyzes the potential environmental impacts of those project along with the associated MMRP mitigation monitoring reporting program. Those three are attachments A and exhibit B and D. Um, so any questions or comment from commissioners on that? Um, all right, seeing none, I actually do um, on this one in two places. And I think my questions are gonna be for Ms. Wallace. Um, in this, it could be to um, Planner Bagat. In the staff report on page 27, there's a chart that lists the potential impacts on the school districts. This is page 27 of the staff report, I believe, although I'd have to get there. Um, and my, I would just like to have, walk that through that chart, which I believe 
says that there's negligible additional impact on the city overall, but it looked like there was differentiated impact on different school districts. And I just wanted to understand um, if I was interpreting that correctly. So this is on page 27, table 12 of the annual impact on the proposed project, the city of Menlo Park General Fund, the Menlo Park Fire Protection District, Sequoia Union High School District and Redwood City Elementary District. We have new revenues, new expenditures and a net fiscal impact. My question is around Sequoia Union High School District, which looks to me to come out at the short end of this by about $460,000. Am I understanding that the right way? And just to, to clarify that, um, I'm sure staff will, will weigh in further um, to the extent that it's helpful, but um, SB 50 defines the school impact fees and that sets a statutory limit on the city's ability to uh, mitigate impacts that are directly to the school district on school facilities. So I think the, the numbers that you're summarizing on page 27 are correct, um, but for CEQA purposes, we are not allowed to identify an environmental impact to the school based on school facilities because um, the project would be required to pay its full um, statutory impact fee as defined by SB 50. Um, the EIR did also um, comprehensively look at other impacts that could affect the schools, for example, um, air quality impacts on nearby school campuses or transportation safety impacts. And each of those impacts were found to be um, less than significant or less than significant with mitigation um, throughout the EIR. So there, there were no unmitigated significant environmental impacts to the schools um, that were identified through the EIR process. Can I ask just a question the other direction then, which is in the big picture, do the school districts get whole out of this or not? So yeah, the, again, in some ways, that line of questioning has been taken away from, from the city by the state. And, and the state has determined that SB 50 is uh, sufficient to mitigate all new developments impacts on school district facilities and their demand. So I mean, you're right, the, the city's fiscal analysis did identify um, a potential funding shortfall as a result of the development, but um, that's not something that we have authority or, or power directly to mitigate because the project will be paying its full uh, statutory mandated SB 50 impact fee for the schools. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Um, my second question um, is on the attachment A, page 27. Uh, and that's related to the transportation um, alternatives. So this may be for now the IR consultant. And I'm just trying to find it on a funky scrolling, excuse me. So one of the alternatives was, if I got this right, was that it is actually within the purview for the project to request a 50% reduction in parking but that the finding of the EIR is that that actually would have an increase in environmental impacts because of the potential for cars driving around in the neighborhood looking for parking. And I wanted to understand the source or the resource or the analytics behind that finding. Um, it's more of a general finding in that this area is not well served by transit so the assumption would be that folks would own cars anyway and they would look for parking 
in the area and circle around creating more uh, congestion, greenhouse gas emissions, air quality emissions. So this is so a secondary impact of, of not providing sufficient parking to serve the demand is the assumption. Uh, all right. Is that for, is that assumption for people who are coming to the office building or for residents of the? Um, for both to some extent. I got it. All right, I, I know a little bit about well, this topic and I'm not. Primarily for residential, right? Most residents would have a car, presumably. Um, I, again, I know a little of this topic. I don't, I don't buy it. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the finding. This is a little bit back to borrow the phrase from earlier about the chicken and egg piece on this. If there is no parking associated with a property, it's unbundled and I can actually then buy something that costs less and I don't have a car and I have other transportation um, that can get me places. Um, I, I mean, I don't quite get I, I mean, I, I suppose in theory, I understand that. And I get that that's what happens sometimes in urban areas with scarce parking, but it's not immediately apparent to me that that would be the finding here. Um, and that's, that's the entire basis for why from an environmental impact analysis, a 50% reduction in parking would actually be a bad thing is based on that? No, I don't, I think it's one uh, part of many, um, I think, the assumption was that to reduce parking by up to 50% was not desired um, from a policy perspective, um, but th that secondary impacts could result is just one part of the finding of rejecting that analysis or that alternative for further analysis. Okay, I'm, I, I don't really intend to grill you because I know on one level, this is not your issue or fault, but I do have to ask this question from whose policy perspective? Who set the policy perspective that that's not desirable? It was, it was a discussion between city staff and the environmental um, technical team about whether or not that would be a desirable um, alternative. To All right. I would, so I, I've talked about this before. Um, this is extraordinarily frustrating for me at no point in our consideration of an EIR is it ever the right time to ask a question about this link of parking and transportation. And ultimately we come through EIRs and this is really thin. Um, and ultimately building more parking is a disaster for our community. I don't know, Mr. Morcos could comment on this. I can ask you a direct question in a minute. But no developer wants to build parking. It costs a whole bunch of money and they can't get the money back out of it. We don't want a parking space where we could have housing in this mix. It's the wrong thing to do in the long term for the environment and for the mix of vehicle traffic and for the transit that we need in our community. And in no point, and the EIR is supposed to be used to create sunshine so that a community gets good information so they could be able to advocate. And this EIR and the EIRs that we look at for all these projects absolutely do not do that in this space around the impacts of transportation on our community and on the environment. Um, and so I am in no way saying that this is your issue, Ms. Wallace, and I really appreciate all the work that you've done on this. But I am voicing my supreme frustration with us in our EIR process right now. It's a disaster for the environment. It's a disaster for development. It's a disaster for equity. It's a disaster for Bellhaven. It's a disaster for traffic. And we will not get it fixed if we actually don't honestly look in these policy documents at these alternatives. So my last comment then is on the alternatives. And again, this is a comment, so it's not a question to you, Ms. Wallace. But it is really frustrating to see an alternative for the projects to look at three alternatives. Essentially, let's do nothing, let's do everything, and let's do the project which is in between. And on all of these, we always find that the do nothing isn't good enough because it doesn't provide the benefit to the community. The do everything isn't good enough because it has too much environmental or other negative impacts. So of course we do the thing in the middle. 
If those are the only three options we look at, it's of no use to anybody in the community to be able to actually use that analysis to be able to inform their opinions about a project. So that's my second real frustration with the EIR. So to the issue at hand, is the EIR adequate? By the definition of adequate, I'm fine voting in favor of this EIR, but I think the way we do EIRs is a complete disservice to our community, to our members of our community and getting the information they need in order to be able to be informed about these projects. And I strongly hope we do these things better in the future. That's my comment on this particular project and on this EIR. So with that, I believe we have a first on the table for Commissioner Barnes, a second from Commissioner Riggs. Um, any further comments from any commissioners before I call a vote on this, which is essentially number one of the six pieces that are on the staff report. All right, let's uh, then call the question. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. That gives us the four votes we need. So I can now actually exhibit my frustration by abstaining um, and it still passes. So I will do that. So the measure passes four to zero with me abstaining um, in a moment of peak, uh, which I will come clean on. Um, and Commissioner Barnes, thank you for advancing our work this evening. Uh, I'm, I'll now turn it back over on any of the other items um, for any commissioner, or I can come back to you, Commissioner Barnes. I believe you actually had the floor, so why don't I uh, allow you to continue as you see fit? Well, out of deference to my colleagues, I don't know that I have the floor I, uh, more than anyone else. I am happy, though, to advance uh, an additional resolution. So seeing none of my other colleagues jumping up and down and saying, don't keep talking, um, I will. Um, I, that said a lot in my life these days, but um, for the purposes of just continuing this discussion. Uh, so I am going to make a, I'm gonna make a motion. Um, so this is where it gets tricky. I mean, it, it's intended to bundle uh, based on the recommendation number two in the staff report, number three in the staff report, number four in the staff report, number five in the staff report. Uh, I know that we've had vigorous discussion about number five. So um, let me ask staff uh, if that's okay through the chair. Uh, yes, by the way. Thank you. Uh, do all four have to be, is there, um, procedure that has all four be bundled together? Or can we take, for instance, looking at the staff report, uh, two, three, four, and then out of courtesy to uh, my other colleagues vote on five separately, or given that we saw in other projects, you gotta take it with it uh, because one hinges on another. If you could just weigh in on that. Yeah, the, the way that the resolution is structured is that all of the amenity, all of the approvals, the items uh, two through five, of, as we've been talking about them referenced on the staff report, are being considered together because as you just mentioned, Commissioner Barnes, um, the approval of an amenity is necessary to support the findings to allow the density under the use permit. Um, so each of the each of the items are linked and should be considered together. Um, based on the discussion that the commissioners have had um, a motion to approve the resolution, approving the use permit, architectural control, BMR housing agreement, and community amenity um, could be offered then with a particular amendment to the community amenity operating covenant to reflect either option one or option two um, based on the level of operating subsidy that the planning commission wanted to approve in connection. Um, I did also want to, to clarify um, the way that the resolution is, is set up and the conditions of approval that the, the decision for the planning commission is between the, the two options about the level of contribution related to the community amenity or I know there was some other discussion about accessibility. Um, 
but the in lieu fee option is something that council has authorized by ordinance and doesn't necessarily require specific um, approval or a vote as an option um, that will remain on the table regardless of which option or other amenity um, direction this body provides. So um, unless the chair or other commissioners have want further clarification, I'll, I'll stop talking, but I think that that frames the issue for you. So uh, thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Barnes. I have a clarifying question, but you have this. Go ahead, and then I'll go from there. Uh, so two clarifying questions. One is just to make sure I understand. If we go down a path and vote for two, three, four, and five, and I will uh, make uh, the five be option one um, for my motion, uh, if that doesn't pass, we don't have a situation where it torpedoes the project. It'll that'll be not passed and then someone else can remake a motion related to what option we pick. It's not an all, it's not a, I'll just leave it there. Is that a correct understanding? That's that's correct, Commissioner. So if, if the motion that you just um, talked about making were to fail, uh, another commissioner could bring, or yourself could bring a, a new motion with a different alternative or a different option that could be deliberated. Another alternative could be after you make your motion, if it gets a second, the body could deliberate that and potentially uh, propose amendments to your motion, which could be considered um, before a final vote were taken on your initial motion. Thank you. And then I wanted to hone in on, you had stated, Council Phillips, that um, should, you'd say there's something in reference to the in lieu fee always being an option after the fact. So is there a chance that irrespective of what we do, there may be an override decision by council to say not uh, option two, option one, we don't like it. We're going to do, we're going to make this all in lieu fee. Is that a potentiality uh, that we're talking about? So the, uh, the vote that you would be taking is to define the community amenity that would be offered if the community amenity is offered on site um, before the applicant is able to obtain building permits, um, they would be obligated to enter into a community amenity agreement to memorialize those obligations or pay the full in lieu fee plus the 10% administrative fee. Um, and the applicant would retain that option to either pay the, the full in lieu fee amount or to enter into the amenity agreement that implements the direction that you vote on and, and approve here tonight. So I'm sorry, now I've got a third follow on question. Um, why is the structure that way? Why, why is there an out for a pick and choose later on down the road for the applicant? Uh, because of the way that the in lieu fee ordinance is structured, um, it offers the, the applicant, especially of a, an applicant in a housing development project, um, the ability we, to select a, a compliant option that would meet the city's objective standards for providing a, um, a community amenity or providing the fee. So um, we're a, a little bit limited um, by some of the, the housing, the special laws surrounding housing projects um, to say that the applicant doesn't have the ability to pay the in lieu fee now that that's been made an option by council. Uh, and that's a, we did that at the municipal level at Menlo Park where that's uh, standard across community amenity agreements in the state. So the, it was a change that was made at the municipal level by Menlo Park to offer uh, an in lieu fee option rather than mandating either an on site community amenity or one of the other amenities from the, the list that was discussed earlier this evening. Okay. Um, thank you. And Commissioner DeCarty, do you have a clarifying? Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, I do. Commissioner Riggs, you have a hand. Please go first, and I, I will follow on after that. It's on the same topic, Commissioner Riggs, because mine is. It certainly is. And okay. I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I think it would be very helpful if staff would put the recommended actions on screen um, during this discussion. 
Uh, yes, Commissioner, we are working on it. It's, there has been a delay in the system, so it will come up shortly. Uh, perhaps you could enable Mr. Barnes to put his copy on by share screen. Tell you, let's uh, let's let's not uh, all become IT experts. We'll let staff to work that through. Um, could I could I also say just as long as I'm on that um, uh, I appreciate uh, the city attorney's position that council has reserved its, for itself uh, the option to um, give an alternative to the uh, chosen amenity. Uh, personally, as a commissioner, I have every intention of defining what amenity I think is appropriate. And if council would like to overrule that, I think that's fine. This relates to my follow on question. So on this particular item, the community amenity, we have as a planning commission, the option to vote for option one, option two, or we could go for, assume it's in our right to say that we don't like either of those options and therefore essentially voting no, because that's bundled, that would stop the project right now. Is that correct? And is there any fourth option that is available to us that could be recommended by any commissioner? Or is it simply those three? Option one as presented, option two as presented, or not approving the community amenity? So there could, I guess there could be an opportunity if um, the applicant were interested in discussing other amenities further, but um, because those have not been analyzed or gone through um, the, the robust economic analysis as the options that have been brought before you tonight, I think it would be difficult for staff to make a recommendation or for uh, the commission to uh, make a determination that a, a different amenity or no amenity would be um, appropriate for the, the project. And I will say that again, because of SB 330 and, and the special protections for housing that the state has provided, that um, once the project has satisfied the city's objective standards um, by proposing an amenity that's consistent with the community amenities ordinance, um, we have um, very limited discretion to turn the project away. Um, so really what we're looking at are um, direction from the council for either, from the commissioners for uh, between option one or option two, um, maybe with the room for some other refinements or direction along the lines of, of what the commissioners were discussing earlier in the evening. Okay, I'm smiling just, you can imagine as a commissioner that that sounds an awful lot like an ask to be a rubber stamp in this mix. Um, but I understand the constraint and the multiple times we've seen this project. Yeah, I, to be specific, and this is to, to counsel again, and I'm not to prejudice where other commissioners may go, but I heard reference this evening that there may be some interest in the in lieu fee option coming from the planning commission. Does that fall outside of the purview of what the planning commission could recommend based on your assessment that you just made? No, so the, the in lieu fee option, um, staff has recommended and, and analyzed that the in lieu fee option is consistent with the BMR ordinance. Um, and again, the in lieu fee option will remain available um, to the applicant on this particular project. Um, even if the planning commission were to approve the project with a specific community amenity um, direction, the full in lieu fee option would remain available. But if the commission um, wanted to eliminate the child care center and just say out of the gates that we will only accept an in lieu fee option. Um, that's something that we could discuss with the applicant and see if they were, um, and see where that was. Yeah. Okay, I guess I, so, so there are potentially then to replay this, we do not have the option to say no, 
uh, because of state law that says there's only how many times we can have a public hearing and we're up against our limit on that. So we have to say yes to something. The options to say yes to are option one is presented, option two is presented, or a conversation with the applicant about in lieu fees. Just do, have I have I summarized the direction, your direction to us? Yes, I think that's correct. Okay, fabulous. Thank you very much. Uh, that was my clarifying question, Commissioner Barnes. I think I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And uh, I will note that my reservation was uh, less about council and their predilections and doing what they want to do with um, recommendations and uh, commission decisions is more, you know, we're giving the way that I just want to highlight the way this it's the way I'm learning it now, the way this uh, ordinance is written. Look, if, if the developer at some point in time later on the, down the road says, says daycare, um, urgent care, any of this stuff is too much brain damage, I'd rather just pay the fee. Uh, they can do that. And I was not aware that that was an out. And that's a big out because you know we've striven for so long to get rid of in lieu fees so that people actually build housing. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing here. It's much easier just to pay the fee and walk away than it is to go through the brain damage of something. Um, providing an amenity. But with that said, I'll put a pin in that. And uh, I will make a motion to uh, approve number two, the use permit, uh, approve the architectural control permit, uh, approve the below market rate BMR housing agreement, and approve the community amenity operating covenant and I will recommend option one because I believe that option two, which, a, which is a half-baked number of, of two million, doesn't, uh, I believe, um, doesn't set up for success. This facility longer term to get its legs under it uh, enough. So that's why I'm gonna go with um, option one. That's my, my motion on the floor. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes, clearly laid out. Do we have a second or a comment? Commissioner Riggs. I will second. All right, a second from Commissioner Riggs. Any commissioner questions or discussion before coming to a vote? Um, again, I, I do have, oh, go ahead, please, Commissioner Harris. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, so I'm I'm still want to make sure that I'm clear. So if 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 one of the options um, sorry. Sorry, my uh, at this late hour my AirPods gave out. Can you still hear, hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure. So if, if, if there is a no vote for this motion, is it possible then, I guess, to ask the developer if they are, op if they are okay with the in lieu fee? I think it's reason. You could ask the developer that question now, um, I think is also completely reasonable if you're uh, interested in doing that. Okay. Okay. So I would like to, for the vice chair, ask the developer um, whether they would be amenable to the in lieu fee. Yeah, I, we are open to it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I hand it back to the vice chair. If I could follow up on that to um, Mr. Marcos, um, could you provide just a little bit more background? You've been listening to this conversation um, about, I appreciate that you would be open to it. I guess if you could offer any more insight about your preference or about why you would have a preference one way or the other. And I, and I realize as you've noted that the potential for in lieu fees 
is something that has come late, very late in this process for you. So uh, recognizing that, but I just wonder if you would offer any more insight that could help us as a planning commission into your thinking and your perspective on, on both option one, two, but this in lieu fee option. Um, yeah, I mean, option one and two, like I've, I've said previously, um, are the childcare in general really driven by limited community amenity list. And us listening to commission and community members and understanding the uh, some of the issues that are happening really nationally, but um, especially uh, focused on Bellhaven. Um, and with the passage of the Luffy ordinance, um, you know, I think we have to uh, maintain as much flexibility as possible given the environment today um, and to make sure that this project succeeds. And so really it's a way for us to maintain flexibility and, um, and, and in a way ensure that this project is as great as it can be. Um, and that, that may involve uh, paying the 100% in lieu fee. That's helpful, thank you. Commissioner Tate. So I, I have a question for the applicant also. Um, Mr. Marcos, I, you mentioned uh, talking to people and, and uh, hearing what the Bellhaven community may want. Um, so how many people did you poll on wanting a child care facility? So I didn't necessarily poll, but we held two in-person meetings prior to COVID and numerous um, phone calls. And education was always brought up as something that was significantly concerning. And, um, and because of that and because of kind of commissions um, uh, suggestions, child care was one area where we could fit it into our project. So it was really a marriage of hearing concerns over education in Belhaven and also our ability to include something on site. Um, just a follow up to that. So, <clears throat> so you mentioned commissions. So um, you spoke with other commissions about uh, what amenities they uh, may want to see. Is, is that what I'm understanding? It was, no, it was primarily from planning commission that I heard um, a child care facility would be a potentially good option for our community amenity. Okay. I, I, I think I might, I probably wasn't on the commission at that point. I'm not sure if I remember that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Harris. Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple things. One is um, I want to thank all my fellow commissioners. Um, it's I know I'm coming at this at the at the latest hours, and I haven't been involved earlier. So I want to just thank all of you for all of your comments and um, thoughts. And I'd like to thank the um, developer for your flexibility as we kind of change. Um, kind of the rules in the middle of the game. I had one quick clarifying question. If we decided to do the in-lieu fees instead of the childcare facility, what then happens to the space that was to be allotted for the childcare um, in the building? Ultimately that would um, be sort of a market driven decision by the developer, the space would be allowed to be used for other zoning compliant commercial activities. Um, we discussed this a little bit and, and felt comfortable that the EIR would cover other, um, other uses because the trip generation for the childcare center or um, other impacts associated with it would be similar to other commercial uses that would otherwise be allowed by right within that space. Um, so it's not something that we would need to define immediately today, but um, they would be able to continue to build out that space and, and lease it likely for um, slightly more office space than was um, originally proposed when that space was being devoted for childcare.
Thank you. Can I ask That's a follow-up on, on that? That's a, I think it's a great question, Commissioner Harris. So based on that response, the developer has a couple thousand square feet is devoted to childcare and has put an 8 million bucks or so behind it in option one. Paying the influ, influ fees, they, they pay a 10% markup and then they actually have the option to make that, that space under childcare is essentially dead to them. But then if they pay the influ fees at the 10% markup, then they've got the opportunity to be able to develop and maximize profit from that space as best as they can through the duration of the project. Is that a, a way to summarize what you just, your answer, Council Phillips to Commissioner Harris? Yeah, and that that's correct. And a portion of the, the value of the child, the way that the childcare amenity itself is valued um, was for um, the outfitting of it for the needs of the child care and the imputed rent, the value of that space over time um, that would be provided to the, the operator, basically that same lost profit. So the, that valuation is baked into the valuation um, based on the economic analysis that the city's consultant BAE did um, for the, the child care amenity. So it ultimately the economic effect of the developer is uh, very similar uh, with the exception of that 10% administrative fee as, as you were just describing. Thank you. I think I saw Commissioner Riggs uh, and then Commissioner Tate. Thank you. Um, so I'm a little uncomfortable where where this is going. Um, I'm more than familiar as an architect um, and a longtime planning commissioner that a developer would like flexibility. And if I were a developer, I would want that too. And I would certainly take a shot at asking for it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as a member of the Menlo Park greater community, I'm simply not encouraged with the idea of cashing out our potential child care center. Um, I, it's not as if we can then just turn around and get a child care center in some better location. I don't believe that's going to happen. As an architect, I've done four child care centers in the last well, maybe six years. And finding a location is extremely difficult finding something that economically works. Um, one of the best opportunities we have, to be honest, is to leverage development. Um, and that only happens uh, in these projects that come before us. It's certainly not going to happen with a uh, 5,000 square foot building uh, on El Camino or, or on Willow Road. Um, and, uh, I, I don't want to treat this as, uh, as questioning as we did with a coffee stop. You know, does it really uh, serve the neighborhood? I mean, child care, a child care center is most likely, in my opinion, to serve the neighborhoods of Bellhaven and um, North Fair Oaks. And to a very small degree will serve uh, the communities of these new projects where personally I'm not expecting to see a whole lot of children. I mean, you're going to pay six $6,000 a month for an apartment when for 6,000 a month over just this side of the 101, you can have a house with a yard on a quiet street on a cul-de-sac. People with kids don't do that. Um, and um, uh, I, I don't want to see this uh, 2,000 square feet turn into a conference center. Um, we've got plenty of those. Um, and yeah, I guess there's still a market for it. 
but we have an opportunity to have a child care center. And nothing's going to be the absolute best location. There are only so many locations. Um, I think the city and Bellhaven, um, although I realize there are differing opinions, uh, are best served by getting a child care center when we can and where we can. And I, I hope we can stick to our guns and get it. So that's, that's just my two cents. Uh, Commissioner Tate. So I, I look at this uh, again as, as uh, um, one of those things that are flawed, uh, just like Vice Chair Ducardi mentioned in uh, option one that we vote, just voted for. Um, <clears throat> And, and why that is, is because the bottom line is that the amenities were not put in place to serve outside of Bell Haven. If an in lieu fees were not an option previously, if in lieu fees would better serve the community, um, because of course the community itself has changed from gentrification um, since that list was put together. So we have to keep that in mind too. The same people who, um, as, as Commissioner Barnes uh, mentioned, uh, that were polled uh, in the Spanish community, as well as Bellhaven as a whole, the majority of those people are gone. And that's just how it is. So if there is another way, since in lieu fees are on the table, to better serve Bellhaven, like using that money now for people, <clears throat> excuse me, who need housing, uh, subsidizing um, as, as uh, Ms. Jones suggested, or another uh, improvement project here in Bellhaven, um, then that makes sense. Um, I, I do have a couple more questions though about this, this uh, proposed childcare. Is there a, something in place to make sure that Bellhaven residents had priority as with the center that's on Chilco. I mean, what's what's built in to make uh, this something that really would be serving Bellhaven? That's my question, I guess, to the applicant. To the applicant. Council. So, so the operating covenant does have a requirement that uh, Bellhaven residents be offered um, priority registration and enrollment opportunities. Um, and then the tuition subsidy is also prioritized. Um, and then each year, the operator and the property owner would be required to report back to the city um, on who was enrolled, where they were enrolled from, and who were receiving the um, subsidized tuitions that were provided from that ongoing subsidy. So the city would have some data points to see um, who was benefiting from the amenity um, at that point as well. Do we have any idea how long it will be um, before, and, and, I, and I know that this it had, won't impact this project, but how long it will be before council um, puts into place uh, how these in loop, like what's going to happen, where, what the in loop fees can be spent on, because I, I feel like, um, so they instituted in loop fees, but then there's no structure to it. And then we're applying it to this project that's in front of us right now. So again, we're back on, on uh, the hamster wheel or, or maybe I misunderstood earlier, but I believe that, um, uh, the principal planner said something about that hasn't even been worked out yet in the beginning when we first started talking about the in lieu fees. So just just curious because, it, like I said, I feel like we're we're doing this again because we can't earmark the the funds for anything, um, and we don't know how they would be spent. Through the chair, I can I can try to take that question. Uh, so, so we don't have I don't have an update. I can, unfortunately I can't give you a, a timeline. I don't have a schedule in front of me, but uh, I I do know it is a priority and it is something that's being worked on. I 
So that's kind of the best answer I can give without starting to speculate on any timing. Um, but certainly I, I understand the concern with regard to the need to create a fund and a structure to deposit the, the in lieu fee um, dollars in if they are paid to the city. Uh, so certainly that is something that staff is aware of and it is a priority to put together and, and we will be coming back in the near future. But that's the best answer I can give right now. Uh, any further questions or comments, Commissioner Tate? At the moment, not at the moment. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm in, I'm inclined to move us toward a vote. We do have a motion and a second, which is for uh, to bundle um, items two, three, four, and five, with five being option one in five. Commissioner Barnes with the first, Commissioner Ray's with the second. Um, uh, I'll come to you in a second, Commissioner Barnes. I'll point out that uh, at some point before we're done tonight, four of us have to agree on either option one, option two, or the in lieu fees. Um, that's what's in front of us. We actually don't have an option to do anything else. Um, so as near as I can tell. Uh, so I just wanna put that before us as we sort through how we're gonna move forward on this. I, uh, and again, I'm inclined to move us toward a vote, but I uh, turn to Commissioner Barnes who had his hand up. I'm sorry, when you say you're inclined to move us toward a vote, you're cutting off discussion. Is that what that means? I, I, I'm headed that way, uh, but I wanna make sure people feel like they've been heard and had all their questions on the table. So by all means. Uh, thank you. I hope my discussion isn't gratuitous. Um, uh, so, but I did want to return to the previous question about preference for Bellhaven. And I apologize if I missed that comment. Or the, the, is there a prescriptive number for preference for Bellhaven residents within the child care center? Was that quantified? And I, that's a question I think for the applicant as well, because I, I believe I heard reference to that earlier. It, it's, it's not quantified in the operating covenant, um, but I will defer to the, the applicant if that's, um, if there's a number target in mind. Yeah, so I guess the number target for the overall child care uh, facility is up, up to 24 children and the operating covenant um, around this basically says enrollment shall be prioritized for children who are residents of the Bellhaven neighborhood. That doesn't have a number associated with it. And then you said something that related to staff as well being prioritized for Bellhaven residents. What, what's the, is there a language around that? Um, I don't believe that there's language in the operating covenant about that, but I do know we've had discussions with all five about it and that's something they are open to. And the applicant is correct. That, that's not something that's written in as a requirement into the covenant. Uh, to, to, to staff, how, how because I wanna make a reasoned decision and, and, and a reasoned decision is based on there being a level of preference, uh, enforceable preference for Bellhaven residents. Um, is it too late to have a mechanism for that? Or how, how, uh, how enforceable is that uh, fairly open-ended reference to prioritization? What, what, what should I, what should I uh, believe that to mean in practice? Well, in, in practice, it obligates the, um, the operator and the, the future property owner to, um, to make a good faith effort to serve that community. And um, if there were to be, if they were to be over enrolled, um, there would be a priority preference for uh, people from the, the target population in Bellhaven to have that preference for enrollment rather than um, having it be open to the general population. So effectively, uh, can I understand it to mean pulling from a list where Bellhaven folks with an address in Bellhaven are higher on the list and get pulled first for eligible for qual or for whatever the um, enrollment is? Is that a correct way to think about it? And that that seems like it would it would meet the 
the applicant's obligation to prioritize. I, the covenant isn't that specific about how to operationalize um, that preference in, in the wait list. Um, and then at any point, will there be opportunity to strengthen any language around staffing from Bellhaven or is that that's simply a preference of the, of the operator? Uh, as of now, that again, that's, that's something that's in, it's not included in the operating covenant. Um, we could include at the planning commission uh, voted to include that. That's something that could be added to the, the operating covenant that there be a, a staffing preference in the same way that there's an enrollment preference. And the reason why I bring that up is the applicant, Mr. Marcos, did reference earlier this evening preference on two levels, preference for people who are enrolled to be from Belhaven and preference to staff and um, being from Belhaven. And I think to get both pieces to the extent possible, or both enrollment and staffing is a double win for uh, the child care center, you know, assuming of course it's qualified folks in that queue. Um, uh, so uh, through the chair, would you be amenable to me uh, asking the um, applicant if he is okay with memorializing that? Not okay. His, his, his take on memorializing that uh, statement that he made earlier into the operating agreement? Yes, of course. And I'll direct that to Mr. Marcos. Yes, uh, Commissioner Barnes, um, we, we stick to that statement. Um, for qualified applicants, there will be a preference for staff and I think we're perfectly fine including that in the covenant. Thank you. Uh, so Council Phillips, is that something we need to, is that enough direction if I were to make a motion for option one with the uh, addition that uh, as current as called out option one, uh, in addition to that preference for qualified applicants from the Belhaven neighborhood. Uh, can I just say that verbally and we don't need to hash out the language of that. Do you have enough to be able to have me make yeah. a motion to that? Yeah, that that's that's correct. So um, you have a, a motion on the floor that's been seconded. Um, if the seconder agrees, you can amend the motion to uh, um, approve the resolution that would approve the use permit, architectural control, uh, BMR housing agreement, and community amenities operating covenant with option one with the amendment um, to add a, a preference for qualified applicants from the Bellhaven neighborhood for staffing. And then we can refine that specific language if that uh, motion ultimately is approved. Thank you. And, and Commissioner Riggs, I didn't want to assume that you that, that was something that was of interest to you. So I'll ask the question. Would that would you be okay with adding that in? Uh, through the chair, I would support that revision. Through the chair, thank you. Um, okay, so I think uh, to the chair, uh, that I've said uh, mm -hmm. certainly enough on that topic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Barnes and everybody. Um, so we have uh, now the amended first from uh, Commissioner Barnes and the amended second from Commissioner Riggs. Any further questions or clarification um, before we move to a vote? Commissioner Tate. Um, so I, I actually am, a, am back on the mix for units, and um, I think I probably have lost that page by now, um, but I believe that the, it, is there some way to get that up, the, the BMR mix? Um, that's that's not it. I wanted the uh, number of units, how it broke down for studios. Yeah. And one Commissioner Tate, I think it's page 22 on the staff report um, if, if staff can't pull that up. Okay. Well, my bandwidth is, takes a long time to load too. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I could also read that off, which is 
right now the mix, and I believe this was recommended by the Housing Commission, is that the very low would be three units, two at studio and one at a junior one bedroom. The low would be 14 units, two studio, eight junior one bedroom, and four one bedroom. And the moderate would be 31 units, three studio, two junior one bedroom, 17 one bedroom, eight two bedroom, and one three bedroom. So all of the two and three bedrooms would be for the moderate. Um, does, is that at least somewhat helpful? Um, yeah, and I'm sorry um, that I'm circling it back around because we did not really discuss BMR, and this is an issue that I did bring up in my initial comments. So um, thank you for allowing me that time. Of course. Um, so I, to the applicant, um, if that's okay, I, I I keep coming back to this uh, each time one of your, your projects is in front of us. Um, I do understand the need for uh, the moderate units. However, um, the lower income folks definitely do need bigger units than uh, piling them all into the um, uh, studios. So it would be great to see some of the 17 one bedroom units uh, mix over a few of them more dispersed in there. And I, and I do understand that, you know, you have to make sure things pencil, um, but I also look at the number of units that you are putting online in Menlo Park at this point and um, that we weren't able to get more for purchase units at, at a, uh, in your other projects. So it would be great if you could do something with that mix. Yeah, we, we understand the request and, you know, that is actually why we, proposed we had two scenarios one with all low-income units which provides uh, some of each uh, unit type um, but when there's an alternative equivalent or equivalent alternative the way that the math works in order to provide any very low units uh, we essentially have to make the larger units the moderate income units in order to achieve the same uh, overall subsidy. And so I'd say if the goal is to have some larger units be at the low level, then you know we have another option on the table for all the units to be at the low level. Okay, that wasn't actually in a chart, was it? Or maybe I overlooked it. The other, the first, the other scenario? Um, I believe because the city is recommending the second option, that is a variety of income levels, they focused on that. But our proposal, which is later on in the staff report, shows both scenarios. Okay. Well, just, just real quick, just to clarify, uh, visually, if we look at the current chart on the screen and we moved everything that is under very low and everything under moderate and collapsed it into low for 48 units, that's what would all be under low. Is that a way to interpret what you just said, Mr. Marcos? That's exactly right, Vice Chair. Okay, so this is essentially the only way to make, the, make it where it's a, a mix yeah. at all income levels. Okay, it's disappointing for me, but I get it. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, any other last uh, comments or questions on any aspect of the project? This We spent a bunch of time on the community amenity, but as Commissioner Tate has pointed out, there are the other elements of the proposal that is lumped together in this, um, this motion before us. Okay. Uh, with that, I am going to call uh, for a vote, which is again for on um, the staff report items two, three, four, and five, with five being option one, with the amended option one that has further clarification about the preference for um, utilization uh, and staffing of the child care facility um, from Bellhaven. Uh, and with that, um, calling the vote alphabetically, I'll begin with Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Harris. No. 
Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. I uh, and Commissioner Ducardi, I am going to vote yes. I haven't commented, so I will on my reasoning. Um, just all the way through on this, I think it's a very attractive project. Um, congratulations to the team and the architect. I think it fits a community scale. Um, it does a nice job blending business and housing, so it feels approachable. Um, I too struggle where Commissioner Tate is on the BMR mix, uh, which is frustrating, but I really um, look to the recommendation from our housing commission and appreciate the work they've put into that. Um, and then finally on the question before us, um, I believe, I suppose this is a punt, but I wanna give a lot of credit to the team, uh, the developer for working through the childcare proposal. I agree with the urgency of the need in our community broadly and specifically. Um, I appreciate the look at trying to um, tailor it for Bellhaven, although I recognize the constraints that have been raised. Um, and also would note that both the developer and the city council have the option to move to in lieu fees um, I don't want to predict anything, but I can imagine that happening uh, in this mix at any rate. So um, I will also vote yes. And therefore it passes four to one with our two absent. Let me stop there and see if I have summarized this aspect of our work correctly. I'll check with Council Phillips. Yes, thank you. So um, when the chair is ready, you can proceed to the, the third item. Yep. So the last thing before us, which is the third item on the staff presentation and item six on the uh, staff report, which I think is on page two, uh, is we need to do the um, recommended, we are the recommended body here and not the acting body. Um, anybody have a comment or wanna propose a motion? Commissioner Barnes. Thank you. I will make a motion that we approve, excuse me, we recommend to the city council that the public utilities PUE abandonment is consistent with the general plan. All right, and Commissioner Rigg, to, uh, carry on please, uh, Council Phillips. Uh, just to, to clarify, is, is the motion to approve the resolution that, that staff had recommended, which um, first, determine that the planning commission would determine that the abandonment is consistent with the general plan and then make the recommendation for council to proceed with the abandonment? Yes. Thank you. Thank, that's Thank you. Commissioner Barnes, Commissioner Riggs, you have your hand up. Uh, continuing in our pattern, I will second. All right. Any other uh, commissioner comments or questions on this item? All right, seeing none, I will call a vote alphabetically, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes five to zero. I believe that is all that is before us on item F1 this evening. I. Uh, I will check with Council Phillips to make sure that's correct before I close this item. Yeah, I, I don't have anything else. Um, Principal Planner Parada, is there any, any other business? Um, so then yeah, I think we can move ahead with the agenda. Great, so let's close item F1. And before we proceed, I would like to check with uh, Principal Planner Parada on our timing um, of our uh, meeting this evening um, and your recommendation for how we proceed. Sure, so, so thank you. Uh, I've, I've definitely been keeping track of time and I understand the commission's desire to wrap up meetings by 11. So it, with that, we, we do have two items uh, coming up. We have the, the EIR scoping session, public hearing and a study session on the proposed project 1125 O'Brien Drive. So my, my recommendation from a staff perspective would be since we do have our technical experts from our EIR consultant here, and we did notice the project for the EIR scoping session to move forward with the EIR scoping session and try to focus on that item today. 
um, depending on how the timing shakes out, I, I think continuing the study session, which is an optional item for the project would be appropriate to another future meeting, but focusing on the EIR scoping session, uh, I would ask through the chair that the applicant uh, make their presentation on the overall project design as brief as possible to allow for time for ICF, the city's consultant, to focus on the EIR scoping session and the findings of the initial study. And I'll be taking over the staff presentation for the project planner, Katie Metter, who is unable to make it tonight. And so I'll also follow that line and make my presentation as brief as possible. All right, that's how we will proceed. Commissioner Barnes. I need five minutes. I, I gotta stand up and I just get some water, do something. So I'm requesting the chat, give me five, get, uh, give us a five minute break, report back. Uh, before I second. Uh -oh. Commissioner Tate. Yeah, before break, I, you know, I voted yes on that and I don't know what kind of drama this causes, but I just don't feel good about it. I'm sorry. I really don't. So we're back on item F1, is that correct? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, everyone. That's all right. Let's all right. Let's step exactly. back and I just uh, it doesn't it doesn't feel right. So let's please check with staff uh, and uh, on what we do in this situation. Through the chair, if perhaps we could take that five minute recess. Uh, maybe um, Eric Phillips uh, with the city attorney's office and I can conference on this uh, this this topic, um, and then we can follow up after. Uh, the five minute recess, if that if that works, this yep, we, we'll, we'll probably provide more information then. Yeah, I'll withhold Terrific. this another statement. All right, so um, by uh, <laughs> by Macintosh clock ten fifteen, uh, we will reconvene, uh, and we will see you all soon.
One minute warning to everybody, if you're within hearing distance. Commissioner Barnes, it looks like, oh, thank you. Your mic was open. I just wanted you to know. I don't think that was me making noise. It's got some salad. Caesar salad, my favorite. How healthy. Well, my kid loves it. Like I've got a, I've got a nine-year-old who eats Caesar salad, so I take full advantage. I put everything in there. <laughs> Good for you. I'm gonna just hide everything in there. <laughs> it's the goal. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you to the commissioners for uh, a coming back and for B uh, to everybody hanging in there this evening through this um, really uh, appreciate um, uh, all of you. And it, uh, evidently we've played stump the staff um, as they're still in conversation. So we'll just wait till they get back and then we'll proceed. I am, I'm sorry, uh, Chair, I, I was um, not immediately right here uh, with my, my ears in when you were reconvening the meeting. Um, what was the... I wasn't. Uh, so now I'm reconvening the meeting. Uh, so, um, but I will turn it over to staff to guide us um, uh, uh, as you see fit. Well, just in light of um, Commissioner Tate's comments. Um, she does have the um, ability to make a motion to the planning commission to reconsider. Um, it's the same the same night that the action was taken. Um, so a motion could be made to reconsider one of the votes that the planning commission had just taken. Um, and if that were to happen and there were to be a majority that motion would have to be seconded. And if a majority of the planning commission voted to reconsider, that would uh, reopen uh, the item that was reconsidered. And then okay. again, we would need a um, majority of the, the body to approve a substitute motion to move forward. Thank you. And when you say majority, is that a majority of the full commission? So we need four votes to reconsider or is the majority of those present, we need three votes to reconsider? Uh, the latter, so it's a it's a procedural item, so a majority of the quorum that's present. All right, um, so I, I think that's clear. Commissioner Tate, do you want to make th that motion? So, so um, to council, so basically, um, since there is only one other person who said no, I'm I'm kind of in a position where I'm stuck, right? Is essentially. Uh, well, you're free to make the motion and the, the body will then decide if there's support for that motion or not. Okay. Well, I make a motion to reconsider, um, uh, I guess, my vote. And this and was on the second of our three, is that the right? Second. The one the one that lumped items from the staff report, two, three, four, and five, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. So there's a motion to reconsider. Um, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Harris is a second. Are there any questions um, or discussion? Commissioner Barnes. Why? Because it doesn't resonate with me, really and truly. I don't think that it is the best option. I think that the Enlufis are the best option for, for Bill Haven right now. And, and all the things that I said previously, even though I voted yes, when I said that the same people who were polled before are majority no longer here 
also, since all five is already increasing their enrollment at their current facility that's being remodeled from, I believe it's 24 to 76 kids, that's pretty significant also. And it's right in the community. Thank you. Excuse me, any other questions or comments? Okay, I actually do have a question. Of, oh, uh, Commissioner Riggs, yes. I'll just comment briefly that um, in my experience with other uh, facilities, if a new facility opens uh, nearby, it can draw um, some of the, uh, shall we say, marginal customers from the original facility. Um, it's a way of saying that spaces may open up um, not just in terms of the additional 40 spaces or however, whatever that growth is uh, from 24 to 76 or, or, or 30 to 76, uh, but it will also take some of the original 24 that perhaps were coming from another neighborhood and now it's closer to go to the, um, to the new location and it's prettier or whatever. So uh, I, I think there is still actually a benefit and it's not entirely that the enlarging of the uh, location on Chilco simply solves the problem. In my experience with childcare, that would be very unlikely. My two cents. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, uh, to counsel, before we call this vote, I do have a question that's material to me, which is uh, projecting forward, if we reopen and then reject uh, the current, uh, essentially uh, the proposal that was made uh, that we affirmed, uh, if we reject that, uh, we then go through potential other options is it possible to come back to the original and vote on that again? Or has that been, once it's voted on, it's been taken off the table for the remainder of the evening? Well, that, that option has already passed. So if you want that option to consider, um, it's cleanest just to um, not reconsider the item. I understand, that's not my question. My question is if we reconsider, and we vote that item down, is that off the table for the rest of the evening? So if you reconsider and then that option fails, then yes, then, then you wouldn't be able to re-vote on that option. You can, you can reconsider it and still adopt it, but if you reconsider it and it doesn't pass, you would um, then need to advance a, a different option. Could we not advance option one with a different amendment? The current, in fact, we didn't vote on option one. We voted on an amended option one. So is it be possible to have a further amendment to option one if we got to that point? I would say yes. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful to me. Any other clarifying questions um, on the motion to reconsider? Yes, Commissioner Barnes. Uh, well, I'm actually going to make a statement now um, because okay. it, it sounds like this is getting real. And I want to really express uh, the wrong direction, I think, uh, pulling money uh, from, this, from this community amenity and dumping it into an in lieu fee for which there aren't processes or aren't procedures. It is up to individuals who are speaking the loudest at the current point in time for how this money is to be spent versus a documented process that was gone through. And to in the moment have a preference for how it's spent to benefit folks in the moment, I think is, uh, is, is, is abdication of responsibility. So I couldn't be more for, couldn't be more against liquidating this opportunity to create funds at the at an unknown discretion for an unknown use based on what becomes popular in the moment. Couldn't couldn't be more against it. 
Um, yes, understand, appreciate the comment. Um, you, you are sort of one step ahead from what this vote is. Um, this vote is is not that. This vote is to the uh, uh, to reconsider. So before us is a motion to reconsider the uh, decision that we made on F1 about the second um, item, the bundled two through five, made by Commissioner Tate, seconded by Commissioner Harris, in calling the vote, um, Commissioner Barnes. So a affirmative is to um, is to affirm the reconsideration. We reopen the item. Um, a no is to not reconsider and to keep the item um, closed uh, and the decision um, in place that we made previous. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. So with all due respect to my fellow Commissioner Tate, I vote not to reconsider. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Uh, no. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Uh, I am also going to vote yes. I think this is a courtesy for a commissioner that I would want to extend to any commissioner, whether I agreed with them politically or not. Um, so the motion passes three to two to uh, reconsider. So let me now turn to Council Phillips. How do we proceed? Um, are, are we essentially coming, what, what, at what point are we now rolling this back to um, and, and how do we begin? So you've already conducted the public hearing and uh, opened and closed the hearing on um, item two or on the, on the entire item. So procedurally um, you're back at the portion where commission can deliberate um, or someone can introduce a motion um, specifically um, since Commissioner Tate asked for reconsideration. Um, you can start with the motion that was, one place to start would be the motion that had previously um, been approved. You can reconsider on that exactly, deliberate, and then um, take it from there. So did we vote to reconsider the entirety of F1? Is that essentially what we've done? Or did we just that specific second of the three that were passed, which is what I thought we had done. I just yeah, the second okay. it was the the second resolution, uh, right. the resolution that was adopting the the use permit, the architectural control, the BMR agreement, and the operating covenant. Um, so that resolution has has been opened back up for reconsideration. Okay, and so is the first and the second still on the table for reconsideration? Is it essentially, um, or there, or there has as, as chair, what am I asking fellow commissioners to do right now um, is to make a motion um, or, or is the other motion still on the table and we would need to essentially re-vote on it? So uh, the, the, the original. Right, yeah, so right now the motion to reconsider that second resolution has passed. So we should, we should do that. And then you can consider if there's any other motions. All right, so the motion to reconsider the second is passed, which means we now need to reconsider. And so we have a first on the table from Commissioner Barnes amended, a second from Commissioner Riggs amended. That is the discussion we are having right now is about that motion, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. So that, okay. that, that, is, that action is now being reconsidered. So it was um, the first and second, first by Commissioner Barnes, the second from Riggs, um, to approve yep. with option one as amended with the preference for applicants for staffing. Great. So I, I, is that clear to everybody on the commission what we have before us? We essentially have a first and a second um, and it is the exact same thing that we originally passed four to one. Um, that's now before us. Um, so are there any questions or comments? And I see Commissioner Riggs, so I'll turn to you first. Thank you. Um, I took a cue from your uh, effort to be considerate of one of the commissioners, and I would like to be considerate of the uh, applicants for uh, item F2 and G1. I unfortunately cannot and will not be continuing with the meeting after 11 o'clock. Um, so uh, I just want to allow 
those involved to make a, appropriate plans. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. I suppose I'll pause there to uh, Mr. Peralta. Is there any comment you have at this moment on that or we'll just continue? So we're in the middle of an item. So I, I need to think a little bit about from a processing order here. Ultimately, uh, if the commission can't continue after 11 in a quorum, then we would need to continue the 1125 O'Brien Drive uh, EIR scoping session and the study session. So that, that would be a question. Um, perhaps since we haven't, well, we're in a little bit of a pickle here because we are in the middle of an item. So I, we, we couldn't really take a vote on whether to continue 1125 or not, but I think we understand the direction that's going in the late hour. Um, okay. That does make sense. We can, we could probably pick that up after this item. Okay. Um, I think the, the applicant team and our consultant probably have an understanding of that at this point. Okay. And any members of the public through that statement. So I'll turn to the, our, uh, our city attorney's office here. Well, I don't have any anything further to add. If if we need, okay, yeah, we we'll, we'll, we should continue with yep. with this open item for the time being. All right, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, so, any questions on the amendment on the uh, uh, the motion before us? Otherwise, I will call a vote. Commissioner Barnes. Uh, yes, thank you. Commissioner Harris. No. Commissioner Riggs. You're on mute. I apologize. Um, restate the current motion. The current motion is the original first uh, by Commissioner Barnes, seconded by you, amended in order to highlight the preference for residents of Bellhaven um, to participate in the child care facility that we previously passed when this item was open four to one. That exact same motion is before us right now, and that's what we're voting on. Well, thank you. So my uh, vote remains yes. Okay. Commissioner Tate? No. Uh, my vote remains yes. So this fails uh, because we only have three yes votes and we needed four yes votes. So the um, that's failed. Uh, we now have the opportunity for any other commissioner to uh, propose um, another motion uh, or to make a comment. While people are contemplating, I do wanna confirm back with Council Phillips. Because of state law, this is the last time we are allowed at planning commission to see this because the city council needs to see it one more time. And that maxes out the public hearings to put a developer through uh, uh, with housing of this type. Do I have that correct? That was a question of the council of Phillips. Yeah, sorry, my, um... my second You're a little hard to hear. All right, sorry. Um, there you go. That's good. Yeah. So we we, in order to stay within the the hearing limitation and preserve a, a hearing for council, um, should there be an appeal, um, the planning commission should take action on the item tonight. All right. <clears throat> and again, just to re um, uh, reiterate. The three options before us are option one, option two, with uh, slight amendments, as long as they're not material enough, that means that somebody has to go back and figure out the money, um, or to propose in lieu fees. Those are our three options before us um, for us to be able to actually act this evening. Do I have that correct? Okay. Commissioner Tate, you, uh, you have your hand raised? So just so that I'm clear, so was this item going, uh, before council anyway, since there was the ability for 
for um, the applicant and for council, I think that's what I heard earlier, to um, pursue the fees as opposed to the amenity? No, so the public utility easement abandonment is scheduled to go to council. They're the final decision-making body on this item. The planning commission is the, on that portion of the item, the planning commission is the final decision-making body on the use permit and the other items that we're discussing right now. Um, however, if that item's appealed or called up to council, uh, council then has the opportunity to, to, to weigh in. Um, if there was confusion before, I'll try and clarify it now that the, the option to pay the in lieu fee um, was created by council when they adopted the in lieu fee ordinance. Um, and the applicant retains the option to pay that in lieu fee um, in addition to the option that the planning commission approves um, or acts on tonight. And then the, the other option as um, pro tem chair DeCarty laid out is that the planning commission could vote to um, direct the applicant to only pay the in lieu fee and take the child care center off the table. And, and the applicant earlier indicated that uh, they were open to, to that direction as well. But if, unless it's appealed or called up to council, this body's action will be final on that front. Thank you. Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, I'm sorry, but um, I think it is beholden on those who um, have upended our approval of this project to come forward with a motion at this time. Uh, I think uh, asking the rest of this commission, staff, applicants, and another team of applicants uh, to simply wait for something to fall from the sky is entirely inappropriate. Commissioner Harris. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I uh, was trying to compose my thoughts. So I appreciate the push, Commissioner Riggs. Um, I understand that this is a really tough situation. Um, I, my feeling is always, I want to do what's best um, to get us the most fairness and the most housing. And I think with the community amenity um, in Luffy, it's, uh, we have, we do have an opportunity to convert that to housing funding. And I understand that we don't have a process for that, which is certainly frustrating. And I, I hope we will have a process for that what to do with the, um, those funds very soon. But I think I have to fall back on the, the thing that makes, seems the most fair and has the biggest opportunity to make um, a difference in our, in our terrible housing situation that we have today. So that's where I, that's where I have to come down on this. Um, and, uh, I guess then I I guess then I need to make a motion. <laughs> um, so I will make a motion. Let me go back to the that. Um, I guess can I just make a motion that it's the the same motion except with the um, using the in lieu fees instead of the child care center. So we have a motion that. Um takes the exact same motion as before, replaces the option one amended uh, child care center with an all in lieu fee option. Um, have I stated that correctly, Commissioner yes. Harris? Thank you. Thank you. You stated it much better than I did. No, Thank you. you. <laughs> no, you did great. Um, 
<clears throat> so um, comment or a second from anybody? I second that motion. Commissioner Tate seconds the motion. Uh, any discussion or comment before we move to a vote? All right, uh, Commissioner Barnes. So a couple things I wanna highlight. Um, if there was a desire to get um, more, so a couple things, affordable, uh, include getting affordable housing as part of the community amenity process was taken out because the purpose of the community amenity process was to provide for amenities to the community aside from you know inclusionary requirements. So a couple, so the money isn't intended to go back into buying more units for affordable. Um, and I don't mean to be a know-it-all, it sounds like a know-it-all now, but the, the premise of taking this money and turning it back around into affordable housing, one, you can always do it cheaper by paying the same developer who's building to, for those units rather than trying to go out to the market and finding those units. There's a reason why in the inclusionary, in the BMR uh, ordinance, the city uh, actively went and disallowed um, in lieu fees for BMR because you want you don't want developers cashing out, taking their money, writing checks, and not doing the brain damage for providing whether it's um, units or whether it's amenities or otherwise, letting the developer off the hook for having to do the work to provide either housing or an amenity is counter to what it is that um, the city has set out to do. The What it's solving for is creating a fund to do something else. Uh, but this isn't going to go back necessarily into affordable housing, um, uh, which may not change things. I want to be, uh, want to point that out. Um, so that's, that's my... Thank you, uh, Commissioner Barnes. Any other comments or questions before we call a vote? All right, Commissioner Riggs, you're off camera, but I will. Any comments or questions before I call a vote? Okay, um, so on the first from Commissioner Harris and the second from Commissioner Tate, um, uh, that's the motion before us um, uh, in alphabetical order. Commissioner Barnes. Uh, thank you, but no. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Um, for reasons stated earlier, I, I could not support that. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Um, I will also vote yes. Um, I, I think this is, um, I, anyway, I think this is a, a great discussion and I appreciate the comments on um, both sides of this, uh, but uh, it also fails uh, because we need four votes and not three. Um, so as a commission, uh, that's where we are at, uh, at 1043. So I to, just to, well, I don't need to recap. Um, so uh, extra credit for somebody that can figure out a pathway forward here. I didn't mean to be flip, um, but um, so let me, maybe I'll just restate my position on this, which is um, I really uh, appreciate and agree with the concerns that I think were well said by Commissioner Riggs about the long-term political wins, W-I-N-D-S wins, um, that could take a, a pool of funding like this and, and direct it in all sorts of different ways. That's a concern uh, for me with going all in on in move fees. I also appreciate that we don't even know what that is yet, that there's still a process. And even if the process landed in some place that was very specific to Bellhaven, it could take a long time uh, where we'd have a project right now. 
Um, so I, I respect and uh, agree with that. Um, I also believe that we're doing a lousy job at meeting the, um, the stated needs of the uh, community of Bellhaven. It has been the most um, historically discriminated against in all aspects of housing and borne the brunt of all of the costs of development that benefits the entire city without seeing the benefits and therefore having um, the, the potential to systemically take a pool of funding and address that is far more effective than what we get stuck with, which is sort of this ad hoc approach that is getting increasingly frustrating for everybody with a list that feels out of date and with items that have been selected. Um, what I cannot figure out is how to propose a motion that can thread the needle there, that can get us to four votes tonight. And um, in a minute, uh, in 15 minutes, we would need to get to four votes with four members present. Um, and I, I will say that I think as a commission, we do owe it to, um, I don't know, it feels to me important that we actually move forward um, tonight, um, as opposed to um, potentially not being able to find a resolution. Uh, but at this particular moment, I cannot find a pathway based on the votes taken and based on the comments made that could find us four votes. Um, but I defer to somebody else who might be able to find us that pathway. So through the chair, um, just to clarify a few statements and just kind of um, looking through the community amenities in Luffy a little more just to make sure. So uh, in, in terms of all the statements that are discussed and, and bringing up the housing comment, I wanna just clarify. So in terms of the direction at the, through the second reading of the ordinance, you know, uh, there is still the unknowns that we've talked about in terms of establishing the fund and, and creating kind of the process, the administrative guidelines for the in Luffy. Uh, but it, the the ordinance does identify, as I stated previously, that the community amenities, with the exception of housing, I do want to kind of clarify this component real quick, just because there's been a lot of discussion on it, uh, would be focused on the area north of 101, between 101 and the Bay. So um, affordable housing BMR units could be provided throughout the city. Just want to kind of make that clarity there. That is on the table for the council through, through the NLU fee. Um, and it does have a, a different geographic reach than... Uh, the other community amenities. So I just want to kind of clarify that. I, I just as we're talking about it, I thought that was a point that would be beneficial to the commission tonight. Thank you, Planner Peralta. As as the commission can continues its deliberations, um, one up the second option, the option two, hasn't been discussed much. So I just wanted to to point that out again that that was something that had been offered by the applicant to um, allow for the provision of on-site child care while also increasing um, the amount of contribution that would be made to the in lieu fee fund. Um, so it in some ways is a, a, a hybrid of the two. So as the commission continues to deliberate and consider its options, um, just wanted to make sure that, that the whole range of options were on the table. Thank you for that. Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, in uh, the interest of moving us forward, um, I would like to make the motion um, to approve the use permit, the architectural, architectural control permit, the BMR housing agreement, and the community amenities operating covenant with the uh, uh, specific that uh, option two for the <clears throat> community amenities um, be selected as the commission's preference. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. We have a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Barnes. 
may I offer uh, an amendment for consideration by the chair that the amount of the uh, subsidy in option two be increased to uh, $3.75 million. It's currently at- I'm sorry. Million. Thank you. I didn't have it in front of me. So, so state that again, Commissioner Barnes. So looking at the subsidy for it, uh, presuming that it's, uh, we can call an audible on this, my uh, friendly amendment to the chair is to increase the subsidy amount from $2 million to $3.75 million for the financial subsidy to give uh, some sort of cushion for this child care facility to be successful. And Thank that you. would reduce in turn the community amenities fee on a pro out of basis. So the uh, increase from- You add a million, 1.75 to the financial subsidy and yep. take actually, uh, Right, take 1.77, I mean, yeah. if financial, uh, add that to the uh, financial subsidy and take 177 from the community amenities in lieu fee. Thus reducing the in lieu fee from 377 to two. To two, to inverting so, the numbers. Inverting the numbers. And just um, one point of clarification, if I may, that the 3.77 million includes the 10% administrative fee for that only applies to the in lieu fee, not to the um, financial subsidy to the child care. So we can increase the financial subsidy as Commissioner Barnes is suggesting, um, but it's not a full dollar for dollar substitution because as the community amenities in lieu fee decreases, the 10% administration fee would also decrease um, because it would be assessed on a smaller base. Okay, so why don't you just say the, don't worry about how it pencils out the other direction, just say the amount that you're asking Commissioner Race to consider as an amendment, um, Commissioner Barnes. Three and a half million dollars to the financial subsidy in the remainder being to the community amenities the, in Luffy. In Luffy. Um, I think that's, that's for the, the maker of the motion. So that goes to Commissioner Riggs. Thank you. So um, I would like through the chair, if I could ask staff first, how they came about the two options, the 5.4 million and the 2 million. Um, and I say this in the context uh, that I'm not terribly comfortable analyzing the um, economics of the childcare facility here at a planning commission meeting. So I'm, uh, I'm seeking um, some kind of view on what staff or the applicant uh, have done in the way of um, uh, a budget analysis. Uh, for example, we don't know what rent is going to, is proposed to be charged for the child care facility. Uh, and that's where the financial subsidy would come in if needed. I mean, if if the rent is going to be 1500 a month, then you don't uh, need uh, presumably the financial subsidy. So um, uh, I guess, um, Mr. Prada, what can you tell us? Sure, so thank you. So I actually have, have a, another follow-up or um, some additional guidance that I also like to provide. So in, in terms of the options here, those were um, applicant provided or submitted options that staff evaluated against our objective standards. So in terms of the $2 million amount, I think that's a question appropriate for the applicant to provide some commentary on. And I believe there was some statements earlier on in terms of the, the how many years that would subsidize um, qualified households or, or children. Um, so I'll, I'll turn that over to um, Andrew or a representative from Graystar. Um, I also do want to, since we are um, providing this question to the applicant, 
it's certainly fine for the planning commission to discuss option or modifications, excuse me, to option two. Uh, ultimately, those would need to be agreed to um, through this discussion by the project sponsor, the applicant. So I just want to kind of make sure that the commission does any amendments here would, would need to be discussed with the applicant since uh, option one and two technically do comply with the city's objective standards of the ordinance. Um, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Marcos. Oh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. So in discussing with all five, the operator here, the $2 million financial subsidy was the minimum they felt they would need to operate successfully. And so that's where the number came from. It advised them, as I previously said, about four years. And during those four years, through kind of their um, fundraising and other means, they would be able to continue operating. They feel comfortable they could continue operating this facility for the term. And, and just one um, clarification, Commissioner Riggs, there's the um, part of this amenity is that they don't pay any rent. And so actually the subsidy is purely for the tuition, staff, payroll, supplies of um, you know, the facility. So you know, we feel this is a good compromise between and this is the reason it was proposed um, as a compromise between providing funds towards the in lieu fund and also uh, providing a child care facility. So with a uh, chair's prerogative, I'm gonna ask a question in a different direction right now, which is before continuing this conversation about that potential shift brought up by Commissioner Barnes, um, we don't have a second and I'd be interested to hear if either Commissioner Tate or Commissioner Harris would be um, interested in seconding Commissioner Riggs's original proposal. Um, uh, if yes, then perhaps we have a pathway through. If no, then um, we can continue on the discussion that we were starting on with Commissioner Barnes. I don't know. I'll, I'll take mine off. I don't know that that's actually um, procedurally okay. I mean, uh, I've asked the question, Commissioner Riggs can choose to decline yeah. um, and I'll pull it, but looking for a better offer uh, is not necessarily, I think, the path forward. So, um, you know, an easier offer is not necessarily the path forward. So if it's, uh, if faced with that, it, then I'll, I'll, I'll just be happy to uh, pull my second and not leave it on the table. Well, we could we can sort through that. Um, let me go to Commissioner Tate, then to Commissioner Riggs. Um, I would be willing to entertain option two. All right, Commissioner Riggs. Um, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Tate. I'm sorry, please. Okay, um, but I would like to have um, have. Uh, the conditions that were in the first one about yep. preference for Bellhaven. All right, so to try to clarify here, Commissioner Barnes is prepared to um, offer a second with an amendment that's headed in the direction he's outlined, Commissioner Riggs. Commissioner Tate is uh, in a potential, potential to offer a second with an amendment that is essentially takes everything off of the, uh, that we did in the first vote um, just replaces the one under option one with two in option two. And I think those go both back to you. And I do see a hand from Commissioner Harris, but I, I think Commissioner Riggs, you're the one that, that made the motion. So let's give you an opportunity to comment or reflect. Uh, the whole purpose of my motion was to find a middle ground that four of us could support. Um, it's, that's why I hesitated to reduce the 3.77 uh, in lieu fee. Um, and thank you to you, Mr. Acting Chair. Uh, it looks like this is potentially a way forward, um, particularly if Ms. Harris agrees. Um, and uh, absolutely, I would expect to include the uh, commissioner's preferences as voted um, earlier for the uh, um, uh, local employment as well as the um, uh, student application. 
So I just like to clarify, I, I mean, in the way that it's written with the 3.77 million going to in lieu fees. Yes. Yeah, as current. That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Harris, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Harris. So um, um, I'm sorry, just procedurally. So does that mean that Commissioner Riggs, you did not accept Commissioner Barnes's second because of the amendment that he proposed? Um, I, I saw Commissioner Barnes second as being withheld and Commissioner Tate alter, uh, offering a second uh, with uh, conditions that I accepted. I'm not sure that I actually um, did a second. I just said that I would be willing to entertain that. And then uh, Harris put her, her hand up. Okay, we're getting there. Hang on, we'll clean this up in a second, um, Council Phillips, but I'd like to hear the spirit of this conversation and then we'll get to the specifics. Uh, Commissioner Harris. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to confirm, I think we have confirmed it since I put my hand up that we would um, keep Commissioner Barnes' um, amendment about staff coming from, preferably from Bellhaven, mm -hmm. um, but but keeping uh, Commissioner Riggs that it would be the 2.0 minimum, or the 2.0 versus the 3.77 would go to the um, in low fees. So not changing that. Sorry, that was super confusing. No, that's um, okay. Yep. <laughs> but uh, so then, yeah, I mean, in the interest of uh, we need to move forward, I, I could support that. All right, so I'm going to pause and turn to Special Counsel Phillips. So first, do you need Commissioner Riggs to actively, I, I heard Commissioner Barnes withdraw his second, and I heard Commissioner Riggs say that he didn't accept it. Do you need us to act on that in any official way? Ooh, Other than that. No, as of okay. now, Commissioner Riggs has a motion on the on the table, which is awaiting a second. Great. Second. So we have a second from uh, Commissioner Tate, and I believe we had a clarification where the motion is not only option two, it is option two with the amendment that originally came with option one that we passed prior is that everybody's understanding of what is on the table and what the second and the first are in this. Uh, concerning local hiring and right. preference and local student preferences, that's yes. already in there, yes. All right, so we have a affirmation from four or five council members. Um, is that also your understanding, Council Phillips? Yes, so well, let's vote. The public, the, the motion, on the table is is to approve a resolution approving the use permit, architectural control, BMR housing agreement, and community amenities operating covenant um, with the following <laughs> amendments um, to incorporate option two, um, as was shown on the screen, a $2 million operating su subsidy and a $3.77 million contribution to the in lieu fee fund, and to add a preference um, for qualified applicants to staffing from the Bellhaven neighborhood in addition to the student preference that exists. All right, so we have that on the table with a first and a second. Are there any further comments or questions from commissioners before I call a vote? All right, hearing none in alphabetical order, Commissioner Barnes. I'm sorry, I believe spending money in the in lieu fee is a mistake, I vote now. Commissioner Harris. Um, I can vote yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. I will also vote yes. That motion passes uh, four to one with our two absent council members. I will now turn back to Council Phillips. Is there anything I need to do with item F1 at this point or can we now close item F1? You can close, thank you, Chair. All right, I will now turn to Principal Planner Peralta. Uh, given this 1103, Commissioner Riggs has already stayed longer than he was able to. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Commissioner Peralta first and, and uh, please guide us at this point. I'm sorry, not Commissioner Peralta, uh, Planner Peralta, apologies. It's okay, I, uh, I was having trouble unmuting myself. So um, give you a chance to correct that. Uh, <laughs> Thank so, you. So, <laughs> Uh, 
so before us, we, we do still have another item, two items technically uh, for the 1125 O'Brien Drive project. Uh, we talked briefly about it earlier. If the planning commission was going to open the item, the EIR scoping session would be the first item that would need to be completed. Um, so we would need to have presentations from the um, applicant, from the um, EIR consultant and staff, staff's presentations brief. Uh, so what the commission has before them as an option, given the late hour, um, you can continue the EIR scoping session and the study session to a date certain. Uh, the next planning commission meeting available would be the August 23rd meeting. So that is a possibility. I was just looking at the calendar. There does appear to be room on that agenda. The commission could vote um, to continue the item if you are, un are unable to complete uh, the EIR scoping session, if you were to start it now. So I'll okay. turn back to uh, Chair DeCarty and um, we can go from there. Do I have a sense of the commission here? We're gonna lose Commissioner Riggs. I know what you are voting for on this. Um, there are be four of us left. All four of us had to stay through that portion of the uh, process. Um, that's it at least some certain amount of time, or shall we continue this to the next meeting? My proposal is, go ahead, I'm sorry, Commissioner Harris. Oh, oh I was just gonna say, I recommend that we postpone. Um, also, it would give a chance for the rest of the commissioners to um, weigh in on the O'Brien project. Okay, I'm sorry, Commissioner Riggs, you had your hand up for a long time, I apologize. I, I do, and I, I, in turn, just wanted to apologize to uh, the applicants um, uh, for the O'Brien Drive project. Uh, I really do have a hard stop today, and this is not normally the case. Um, and I look forward to um, taking part if it's, uh, if it's available in two weeks. And thank you to Mr. Parada for helping us uh, eventually reach a um, uh, consensus on the previous item. And good night. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, any other conversation about whether we continue uh, this item or we proceed with the EIR? Commissioners Tate Barnes. Yeah, I, with all due respect to the applicant, I, I think I'm done as well. I think 11 o'clock um, was a reasonable expectation for this evening. Okay. I, th I think I get the sense of where we're headed on this. I just, mostly I'm cooked. I don't think I can do a good job on this right now. I think this scoping session, I think both of these items are really important, but I, um, I don't take it lightly. And I really apologize for, uh, to the folks with the O'Brien Drive project and to staff uh, on all of this. And um, I'm sorry that this is where we have ended up this evening. Um, Mr. Prada. Yeah, so if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if the commission could make a motion in yep. a second to continue it, uh, and I would, yep. I would recommend a date certain, uh, the, eight, the August 23rd meeting, if that can get in the motion, um, that, that would be appreciative. That's kind of the, the appropriate yep. approach here. Thank you. Commissioner Barnes. Make a motion. We continue uh, the next item to the August 23rd, if I have that correct, the meeting. Okay. Do I, is that the way we should do that, Mr. Prada? Just to be technical, if we could, if we could uh, continue items uh, F2 and G1, uh, just to make it clear that it's both the EIR scoping session and study session. I know it's a little technicality, but that's all good. Appreciate it. Okay, I'll revise that. On tonight's agenda, uh, Planning Commission meeting, August 9th, I move that we uh, continue F2 and G1 on tonight's agenda to the August 23rd. Uh, planning commission meeting for the Menlo Park. All right. Do I have a second? Commissioner Harris. Yes, I second. And I too thank um, and apologize to the applicant. Okay. Any further discussion or comment? All right. Although, uh, uh, Commissioner Barnes, this is the vote yes or no. Oh. Let me see here. I might want to stay around later. <laughs> I got nothing else to do. <laughs> yes, I vote in the affirmative. Continue, please. All right. Uh, Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Commissioner Cardi votes yes. That's four, which by any amount of bodies we needed to vote yes, I believe we pass a threshold and we'll continue those two items, which means we, I now move past those. We move to item H, which is informational items, future planning 
commission meeting schedule. I'll turn that over to you, Mr. Prada. Yeah, so so August twenty third has a EIR scoping session and a study session. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we we do have other items that mean as well. Uh, there are there are two single family homes, um, and, and then further out we are tracking in the September uh, timeframe a, a number of other kind of CEQA related projects, uh, in, including some other EIR scoping sessions. Uh, so just want to kind of give the commission a heads up on those, and and certainly we'll be sending out notices. Uh, closer to those dates, those are all tentative now, but just wanted to kind of track those items uh, for the September timeframe. And so that concludes my reports and announcements. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Principal Parada? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, before I close the meeting, I just want to point out one thing. Uh, when Steve Kerr was coaching the Warriors and he had a bad back and he had to leave, the interim coach stepped in and won like 24 games in a row, but it actually accrued to the coach's record. So I just want the record to be known that this is Commissioner Doran who kept us here until well after 11 o'clock at night and not Commissioner Ducardi for the permanent record. So Commissioner Doran's string of getting us out um, punctually has now officially been blown up. Um, <laughs> with that joke aside, I wanna thank everybody involved in here this evening, including staff and to all commissioners. Um, just really um, hard stuff and complicated stuff. This is why we come to together as a community. We're all deeply committed and it showed tonight. So thank you all. Um, have a great evening and looking forward to seeing you in two weeks. And with Thanks, that, sir. I adjourn our meeting. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Parada. I really appreciate it. Yeah.